I would like to give you uh, some practical information first. This is being filmed. The reason it's being filmed is because I, I have paid for it to be filmed because I wanted you to have a, a lasting memory of this day. There's another reason why it's filmed and why I have handed out the PowerPoint presentation in the Telegram group that I have created just for this because, uh, well, by, by way of a little story, Steve Ward over there, who will be coming on this stage in an hour's time, he's got a PowerPoint presentation of just six slides. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he wondered if it was too much. <laughs> but then I told him that my PowerPoint slide was 801 slides. And he looked at me like you might look at a <laughs> lunatic. But ladies and gentlemen, the reason why I want to give you 801 slides is because I feel that I got something that will be of lasting value to you. And I have chosen a topic which is, of all the topics I could have chosen, I chose the most difficult of ones. I've chosen some hardcore analysis of the FTSE index. The reason why I chose that is because I felt that if I can trade the FTSE index successfully, then I believe I can trade pretty much anything. And I have had great problems with the FTSE index. And I looked at, well, we'll get to that. So do I think that I can go through 801 slides in the two hours that I have at my availability? Well, do the math. There's uh, 7,200 seconds in a, you can do the math. We're talking about about eight seconds per slide. And I've already spoken two minutes about one slide. So we can see we're already lagging behind. The reason why there are so many slides is because of all the documentation that I have proven. So I'm going to postulate something. You know, a professor will postulate a hypothesis. I want to not postulate. I want to actually take you through the entire journey that I have been over the last three months from acknowledging during mid-year that my FTSE trading was not good to what I actually did about it. and. I feel that if I am able to give you the very tools that the strategy that I saw, that I realized what was going on, I actually think that you're going to come away from here going, oh, that was really interesting. Uh, a little bit iffy in places, but really, really quite interesting. But considering I got 800 slides, I think I'm just going to get going immediately. And then in one hour, someone is just going to give me a little not and saying, now it's Steve's turn. Steve is then going to take the stage for one hour. And by the way, Steve, thank you so much for being here. It's an absolute pleasure to share the stage with you. Then <laughs> and then when Steve has done his hour, uh, maybe we also need a five minute break at some point, I imagine. And then I will carry on for an hour as well. So. Um, I won't spend too much time on a disclaimer. It's just to say, you know, you're all ad adults and uh, la di da di da. Good. This is the temperamental little thing I got here. So this is what I would like to go through with you today. First of all, I want to talk to you about what is situational analysis. So we are so used to technical analysis, moving averages, Bollinger Bands, Fibonacci ratios, and it gets more and more sophisticated now. It's footprint charts. It's uh, what's that gentleman in uh, in America, uh, inner circle trader, liquidity trap, and uh, and all of these fancy things. Great, I have the greatest respect for that. However, I I can't help but thinking that being really really good at technical analysis doesn't necessarily ensure that I will be a good trader. Now, that's what I got Steve Ward for it, because he will somehow link the bridge between what I know and what I'm actually able to execute. It's the old Liam Neeson scene with Christian Bale out on the pond in Batman Begins. You know, knowledge is nothing without the will to act. So you've heard me say it many times before. I won't bore you to tears with it again, but nevertheless, I feel that often time in the evolution of mankind, and especially our own personal journeys, there are things that we know, and then there's things that we do, and those two are not necessarily aligned. And I think from a personal point of view, but I think I, 
I think many of you will share that sentiment, that many of you know that you have within you the ability to be better traders. So part and parcel of me presenting an 801 PowerPoint slide, and there's only one of them that says Merry Christmas. So that's 800 slides, which really pertains to Okay, this is hardcore research. I didn't want to stand here on a stage and give you two hours of la di da di da. It's just not what I do. And this will either be my greatest idea ever, or I'm going to sink like the Titanic. We will only know in a couple of hours' time. Obviously, I'm going to do my very best to make sure that these two free hours will absolutely fly. But perhaps more importantly, that you are going to get a deep insight into, in this case, the FTSE index. But more importantly, you will get a really, really deep insight into what a full-time professional high-stake trader actually does behind the scenes. And by there, I'm not talking about what I had for breakfast, but I'm talking about the level of preparation that goes in and why I use something called situational analysis. The PowerPoint presentation will be in your possession. And once uh, the, that gentleman over there called Alex, he has actually edited the video. It is yours to have for free. No, 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 no additional cost or something. It is yours because I want you to have that as something that you can refer back to constantly in your quest to better yourself as traders. I also want to talk about uh, how to relax with a little exercise. And well, you can see the rest of it here. So let's get cracking with what is situational analysis and how is that different to what we know as technical analysis? So I'm mindful, immensely mindful. I'm just going to talk myself warm. So I might just be reading a little bit from the slide. I am mindful that day trading is immensely challenging and taxing on both body and mind. I know that because I know that once the trading day is over, is it been in one of those really volatile days or even one of those, you know, turtle quiet days that's been recently, I find myself being overtly tired in my mind and also in my body. So, so I've come to the conclusion that the only way for me to do my job well is to attack it on all fronts. It means I have to make sure that I sleep well. A little funny, a little funny side story because we don't have that much time for side stories. But I've learned to brew kombucha this year. But what I really didn't know was the caffeine intake that uh, kombucha presents. So when I was gosling down half a liter of kombucha for dinner, no one actually told me that I was gosling the essential of 10 espressos just before, b before bedtime. And I've been struggling with sleeping in the last couple of months, not really realizing there was probably all the caffeine that was coagulating it through my, my blood streams that kept me awake and all really jittery. So I cut it out and I've been sleeping like a baby. Kombucha is good for you, but apparently a half a liter before bedtime is not so good for you. Anyway, joking aside, I look after myself both physically and mentally. I make sure that I sleep well, I make sure that I eat well, but I also incredibly mindful of how I eat and when I eat. And I don't want to make this an exercise into diet because I am not qualified to give that kind of guidance. However, I, I wonder if you can just imagine that you've just come from a lunch with a friend of yours and you've had the biggest bowl of pasta at that lush Italian restaurant around the corner where from you live, and then you're sat down for the US session. And about 30 minutes into the US session, no matter how volatile the Nasdaq is, you simply can't keep yourself awake because your blood sugar has just dived through the floor. I will at all cost avoid something like that because if there's something that it does, it kills my concentration. Now, that was the more personal front, but I have also grown incredibly cynical about technical analysis. Technical analysis in any form that you can think of, higher highs, higher lows, um, double bottoms, double tops. And it's not that it doesn't work because all of it works some of the time, but nothing works all of the time. A very famous trader called Tepid on a on a bulletin board called Avid Trader once said that. And I've always remember it because there was someone who was immensely qualified, immensely professional. But he also had to acknowledge that even though he had all the skills and all the expertise and all the trading hours in front of the screen, he too, excuse me, he would face things that he hadn't seen before or he simply was incapable of trading the market well that day. 
So I felt that in order for me to truly optimize my time in front of a screen, I actually had to be much more specific. Um, let me cast your mind back a year. Maybe you can relate to this yourself. The DAX has just opened, and it does what it does. And you're thinking, oh, I'm quite bullish, or I'm quite bearish, or whatever it may be. What should I do? Should I be a buyer or should I be a seller? I was in those shoes as well, and I've been in those shoes many, many, many times in my life. But then I realized, actually, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be the, I am bullish or I am bearish. Because, as I will show you in one of the slides, I went through 30 years of Dow Jones history, ladies and gentlemen. 7,500 trading days I investigated in the Dow Jones index. And I statistically concluded that over the last 30 years, half of all Dow Jones trading sessions closed higher than the previous day's close. And the other half closed down on the day. So I thought to myself, what's the point in being really bullish or really bearish when actually, even though the Dow Jones over the last 30 years have gone from a price level around 3,000, that's where I was trading. About, about 30 years ago, the Dow Jones was trading around the 3,000 mark to today being at 35,000. So even though that we had an absolutely exponential bull market over the last 30 years, the distribution of winning days to losing days in the Dow Jones index is still 50-50. So I felt, well, hang on. If that really is the case, I might as well just flip a coin and then decide whether to be bullish or bearish. Because the odds are with that, well, I'm dealing with randomness anyway. So that led me to a much more specific approach to technical analysis, which I had then coined situational analysis. And that's not me being a snob or anything like that. It wasn't because I wanted to stand out. I just thought it's not quite technical analysis. No, it's specific to a situation. And it actually started with the FOMC research that I did, where, where I developed that, that rule that I call the rule of four, where you take the 10-minute chart after the FOMC day, and then you say on the fourth 10-minute chart, which coincides with when the press conferences has been 10 minutes into their session, I'm actually going to bracket that. I'm going to be a buyer above, and I'm going to be a seller below. And right now, it's got a pretty flawless track record, track record of either breaking even or making money at a 100% rate. I'm sure we will experience a loser one day because, of course, nothing ever works all the time. So I coined that situational analysis. And what I want to do, introduce to you today is what do we do? What do we do? if the first bar of the day in the FTSE is negative. How do we deal with that? And we'll get to that. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Now, I want to tell you just a, a, a slight little story, which is in here. Uh, I did a very thorough review of my trading abilities some years ago. And I found that I was probably just the best trader there was around, but only from 8 AM to 10 AM. If I judged my performance from 10 a.m. until about 2 p.m. UK time, I would probably fall into the category of meh or kind of, you know, yeah, a bit hit and miss there. Very good from 8 to 10, not very good from 10 to 2. And actually, OK from 2 to 4, but not great. Definitely much better in the morning. Then I went on holiday. And this is while I was working for a CFD broker called uh, City Index. And I was allowed to prop trade uh, the company's account. And during that holiday, which was a 14-day holiday, I did very well. I did so well so that when I came back to the, uh, uh, to the office, the boss called me and said, so much on a bit of a roll. And the truth is, ladies and gentlemen, I actually didn't know how well I had done. I had just traded. And it kind of led me to think, well, what did I do that was so great? Because I was on holiday, and I didn't trade that much. And I kind of reverse engineered, and I decided that, one, I slept more. Two, I only traded at very specific times of the morning. And then I bucked off to the pool. And I, as a result of it, I placed far fewer trades than I would normally place. So 
back to situational analysis. I, I run a telegram group. I do it free of charge because I think it's fun. It's nice to have someone that you are responsible for and you're also accountable to. That accountability is of great benefit. Because what, what, what another side story, sorry. But do you know how you separate yourself from, for example, some of the people that Steve Ward will no doubt discuss? Because Steve Ward, he is the, you know, he's the coach to the, you know, the creme de la creme, the really hedge fund phenomenals. But do you know what they have that we don't have? They have someone looking over their shoulder saying, hey, Bob, do you think you've done enough damage for one day? Maybe you should just take a break. We don't have someone and coming and nobbing on our shoulder and saying, hey, should you cut it a day? And if you have completely unrestricted ability to do as much self damage as you can possibly muster in one trading session, and let's face it, ladies and gentlemen, we all sat there and said, Fuck you, Dow, I'm gonna short the shit out of you for no other reason, for no other reason that you piss me off. All of us have done that. We've all found ourselves with that red mist. But Bob doesn't have that red mist because he's got a compliance manager going, enough for today, Bob, right? It is it. We don't have that, so we not only have to have a flawless strategy, we also have to have a flawless self-control. So what I am arguing here, ladies and gentlemen, what if we actually developed an approach to trading which was much more situational than just sitting there aimlessly throughout the day from early morning to late night thinking that we can maintain that level of concentration for that amount of hours? That is what I want to talk to you about. So I released the first uh, to you, and I'm happy to do these things because I find, and, and obviously I'm hoping that when I tell you about the first bar negative in the FTSE, it's not gonna have the same fate that my school run strategy, which I've lost. A school run was fantastic in, in August. I made a lot of money, and I was on holiday, which was the greatest part of it. And then September, all my performance nosedive. And then October seemed to find another you know, second breath. And then all of a sudden, November, school run, an aggressive school run. I mean, I might as well just sign over a Blanco check to the, to the broker at the moment, because nothing seems to be working. My, my FX trading is to pits as well. But you know what? I stand here on a stage being totally and brutally honest about it because I know that the worst thing you can possibly happen is to have some YouTube guru that never ever loses. And it's frustrating because who are you kidding? Who are you kidding when you think that, no, that you never lose? Of course you lose. We all lose. In fact, I wrote a little book called Best Loser Wins, and it's all about how to actually lose well so that you are able to win in the long run. So hardcore analysis. So to set the stage for the research, I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to present, I want to go over the last month only. And after I've done that, I want to go back over the statistics for the last four years. So over the last four years, there's been approximately 1,300 trading days in the FTSE 100. I mean, about 1,200. It's a little bit more than a year. So before I, I do that, I want to talk to, to, to you briefly about the realities of trading, because it is a difficult profession to master. And I, uh, I say that as a, someone who has made his living to do this um, every single day and making his bread and butter from what I make. But I also say that from the point of view of someone who has worked for a brokerage for 10 years. Uh, <clears throat> I'm about to present to you some research in the FTSE which I know has statistical significance. But you, some of you witnessed the, uh, uh, the little memoranda we did for David Paul. Well, David Paul once said that if only I was as mentally strong as my trading systems are robust. What he meant by that is if only I was able to execute my strategies flawlessly, every single time, because unlike me, my strategies are very strong, but I, I'm just a feeble man, and at times my energies will vane, and I won't be as consistent in my application, if only I was. So why am I bringing this up? Well, I do that because 
I wanted to just run through some basic mathematics with you. And that is, when I left the city about 10 years ago, 13 years ago, I earned an income of approximately 100,000 pounds a year. I was very well paid, there is no doubt about that. In today's money, that's probably 150,000 pounds. So, if I trade the FTSE in 300 pounds a point, which is the same as trading 30 lots at a time in the futures market, if I was going to replicate my income that I had back then, I had to make 500 FTSE points a year. Is that achievable? Well, break it down. Say you don't have any holiday at all, you have to make two FTSE points a day. If your life depended on it, could you make two FTSE points? I'm pretty sure that you would be able to find one way or another to find two FTSE points in the FTSE 100 index. But, you know, I can stand here and I can talk a pretty good game. Once you have been standing on a stage once and you, uh, you sort of get over the initial stage fright and the, and you know, the whatever, apprehension you have in talking to a big crowd, you sort of just you sort of settle into it and then you sort of begin to rely on the material. So I can talk a good game, but do the statistics on my performance actually add up? Am I as good as I say I am? Well let's like we look at it. Am I able to make two FTSE points a day? Well, in January I did okay. But it's not exactly two FTSE points a day, is it? It's one FTSE point a day. February, oh, I didn't win two points. I lost two points on average. Then in March, I came roaring back, but only to give a third of it back in April. And in May, I just didn't trade FTSE. And in June, losing again. July, losing again. And that's when I thought, this can't go on. I am not as good as I think I am. And that's when I began to really uh, nail down on what I'm teaching you today. And the results showed up. 32 in August, 68 in September, 67 in October, and I don't know where we are in November. Uh, so with the right kind of preparation, I think it is possible. But there's many angles to consider. Do you have enough funding? You know, ESMA has made uh, leverage trading difficult. We can only trade with 30 to 1. Are you even able to handle leverage if you go with a broker outside the European Union? There are brokers out there that will give you 200, 300, 400 to 1, but not everybody can handle that amount of leverage. And then can you actually trade? Can you be that focused to make two points a day and not get bored? Let's, uh, let's just look at the average salary in the, UK, is in, the, in the European <coughs> Union. Here's the salary breakdown in different countries. Imagine that I wanted to make 5,000 euros a month, and I wanted to make two points a day. I would have to make 40 FTSE points every single month. In order to do that, I would have to risk 125 euros a point. That will require about 4,300 euros in my account to do so on a 200 to 1 leverage. No, those are just facts. Why am I talking about this? What's the point? You knew this already. It's what comes next. What is also a fact that in order to benefit from what I'm about to show you, you need to be able to run your winners and be de disciplined with your losers. You are most likely going to have a very big inverse looking extrapolation, meaning that you will probably have many small winners and many small losers and some very big wins. Now, what I want to do now is I want to go through the last month. So now we're gonna get specific, ladies and gentlemen. This was just the preamble. Now it's going to get very heavy as if it was a lecture at a university. This is not an inspirational talk. It's going to be very, very heavy. The focus is on the first candle of the day. By first, 
five minutes a day, I mean that candle that takes place from 8 a.m. UK time until 8.05 UK time. If you are in Europe, you'll have to add an hour, maybe two, depending on where you are in Europe. What's the setup? Well, what you're seeing here are two different FTSE charts. They both go up, but the first candle of the day to the left is positive. And on the right chart, the first candle of the day is negative. So what we're doing now is that we are creating a situational analysis piece of research. I asked myself a very simple question. And this was prompted out of necessity. You know the expression that necessity is the mother of all skill? Well, every single morning, I was presented with the FTSE doing what the FTSE was doing. Going up, going down, sometimes marching up, sometimes just not doing anything. And I thought to myself, how do I create a piece of situational analysis out of the FTSE index? Well, I did school run, I did aggressive school run on the FTSE, and I didn't feel that it statistically held up. Didn't feel that it gave me something of value. Then I began to explore with other options. What I specifically asked myself is, how shall I trade the FTSE when the first candle at the open is negative? Should I be bearish? Should I be bullish? Is there an edge to be had? As I stated on my last page, my research is not completely done. But I have looked back over the last 1,250 trading days in the FTSE index, and I have separated every single I have separated every single chart from those where the first bar is positive from those where the first bar is negative. And I have ignored every single one where the first bar is positive. And I have only looked at where the first bar is negative. And what I found, ladies and gentlemen, I felt has been the reason why I've had a much better performance in the FTSE index over the last four months. Now, you can judge for yourself. So, over the last 22 days, I trade with a broker. We won't mention names because this is certainly not advertising for them, but that broker on their five minute chart will only have 22 trading days. So I look back over the FTSE ahead of this talk for the last two uh, on the last 22 trading days. Seven of those 22 trading days, the first candle of the time frame was positive. And 16, sorry, 15 days had at its first candle a negative bar. Now, as I point out here, this is a statistical outlier because when I did the research over the last four years, ladies and gentlemen, the allocation of the first bar being positive and the first bar being negative is 50-50. So why the last 22 trading days has got that kind of profile? Well, it just goes to show that it happens. Now, what I'm going to do now is take you through very slowly and meticulously, but not so slow that you fall asleep, what I actually mean by this and how I trade him. When you look at the first bar and you see that it's a negative candle, then what can happen? Well, the second candle or subsequent candle, third, fourth, fifth candle, can go below the low of the first candle. Or the second candle can go above the high of the first candle. Over the last 22 trading days, the market went below the low 10 times. And over the last 22 trading days, it went above the high for five times. Conventional breakout theory would say that we should buy the breakout high and sell short the breakout low. But what if we don't, ladies and gentlemen? What if we turn that argument on its head? Let's start with what if I short at the high of a negative bar? 
This arrow, the blue arrow, highlights a negative bar. What if I sold short there? Now, I know what you're thinking. I wouldn't do that because the market's going up. But you don't know that at the time. We are talking about what kind of action can you begin to implement today that will give you a statistical edge over the next many years. I didn't know that that was going to happen. If I did that, I would have bet the farm to go long. But what if you had shorted right there? Let's look at that. Or what if you had bought there? This is the first bar. What if you bought right at the low of that bar? Let's look at the numbers. But before I do, let's take you through the last month, OK? We'll do that relatively quick. These are 22 charts coming up. You might be thinking, why, is, uh, why were there only 15 observations? Well, because out of those 22, seven of them had a positive candle. So those I'm obviously not discussing. Here they are, one by one. What if I bought right there? What if I bought right there? What if I bought right there? It's not looking good right now, does it? But you just wait. Just wait. What if I sold short right there? What if I bought right there? What if I bought right there? What if I bought right there? Because that's at the low. What if I bought right there? Because it goes below the low. What if I sold short right there? What if I bought right there? Mm, what if I bought right there? It does go below. What if I sold short here? What if I bought right there? What if I sold short right there? What if I bought right there? OK. Now, we've gone through 15 charts. And you're thinking, oh, Jesus, that's a lot to take in. All of this is in your files. But what actually becomes very interesting now is how does the stat add up? Well, let's take a look at what actually happens. First, I'll look at what happens when the second bar goes above the high of the first bar. Over the least last 22 trading days, we had 15 observations. On the first one, it goes three points above. On the second one, it goes nine points above. On the third one, it goes 48 points above. Then 27, and then 0 0.5. Now, how much does it max go in your favor if you had shorted at the first candle high with a 10-point stop loss? Well, on the first one, you would have had a maximum. When I say maximum, that's the, if you had perfect, perfect foresight, you would have maximum gotten 39 FTSE points out of it. So there's 39 points to be had. There's 45 points to be had. And then twice you lost 10. And then you had a max profit of 68. In other words, you have an absolute dead certain 20-point loss. Absolutely dead certain. Nothing can be done about that. But you have a potential of uh, what's 68 plus 45 plus 39? Is that about 100 and 153 or so, thereabouts? If you had to make up, do you want to do the math? Are you 113, 100 and 150. Did I say 153? Oh my god, I was out by one. Jeez. If you had a maximum of 154 points, you're not going to get 50, 154 points. Of course you're not. Are you going to get half? You're going to get about 76? Maybe. But do you think you'd get a third? Would you be able to get a third out of 150 points? That means you'd get 50 points. So you have two dead certain 10-point losers, and you have potential of 150, of which you have to make a third of it. Now do you understand why it is so important that we learn to let the winners run? Because if we don't master that lesson, we will never be able to make something as promising as this 
actually work out to be a fantastic strategy. Okay, let's carry on. What if you hadn't used a 10 point stop loss? What if you just used a five point stop loss? Imagine it, there we are, it is Tuesday morning, the foot has just printed a big fat red candle. And you have an opportunity to buy that low, which is around, say the low was 50, and you were able to buy it at 50, or 49 perhaps, and you put a stop loss at 44. Would you make money from this? Well, you would, you would stop out three times. And then two times, you have a profit potential of approximately 100 points. So you lost 15 out of those 100 points. I reckon all of you in here would be able to extract 15 points out of 100. Probably you probably even do better. Now you might be thinking, oh, hang on, this is very sweet, but this is based on what? Research on what? A month, 22 trading days? If I was gonna do something like this, I need that to be substantiated to a much greater extent than just 22 days. And I agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. Okay. Flip the switch. Do you know what flip the switch mean? Do you know what flip the switch mean? Yeah. Flip the switch mean that you have been short the market and all of a sudden, contrary to your otherwise brilliantness, you realize that this market is probably going up rather than down. So you flip the switch from being short to being long. It is one of the hardest mental exercises to do consistently and diligently without actually losing your mind. I know a gentleman called Larry Pesavento who says to me, I can't do that. I can't go from being short to being long. I need to have a step away from the market. Are you able to flip the switch? I'm not saying you have to be to be successful, but having that mental flexibility to go from, I'm really bearish, really bearish, to I'm really bullish, really bullish. The sooner that you are able to create that kind of behavior in your market, the so in your, in your behavior, in your approach to the market, the sooner you will stop agonizing over being on the wrong side of the market. What if we had a, a flip the switch after 10 points? So you would still make money on the first one, but those where you lost, all of a sudden, you have a max profit potential of another 38 or 17. I'm not saying that you need to do this my immediate conclusion is that I can't draw a conclusion based on 15 occurrences. You just can't. So we'll ignore that conclusion temporarily. But can we conclude that if the first candle is negative, it makes sense to short the high of the first candle? Well, based on this sample, yes. But I would need more evidence than just a month worth. Okay. What if I buy the low at a first negative bar? You have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, this is situational analysis at its core. On any given trading year, you're going to have 125 days where the FTSE will open with a negative bar. Wouldn't it be fantastic that out of those 250 days that you're engaged with trading, 125 of them, you know with absolute clarity and certainty what exactly you're going to do without any kind of a hesitation or doubt. You know, okay, this is a negative bar. I know exactly what to do. When I was doing the, uh, when I was doing the, uh, after David Paul's memorial, I stood and I chatted with people uh, for a couple of hours outside. And there was a gentleman that asked me a question and, and I answered him like this. It was something to do with rehearsal. And I said to him, look, I have a friend who is a commercial airline pilot. He, he, I think he flies for, for Thomas Cook or it could be Chewy or, or one of those. Anyway, once a year he tells me they have to go into a flight simulator. And in there they are put through their paces. And so I said to him, well, what are you like? You're taking off from Heathrow and it's a nice sunny day and you're landing in Copenhagen. And said, yeah, you wish. It's more like I'm setting off in a hurricane. All of a sudden, my co-pilot has a heart attack. The stewardess turns out to be a terrorist. And by the way, they're out of Paninis and one of the engines is on fire. Now deal with it. That's the kind of thing you are put through in a simulator. You're not put through a, a nice summer day. So what if I could actually teach you something that happens approximately 11 times every single month. So when you are there, you know, that's a negative, but I know exactly what to do now. 
Just like my friend who's a pilot knows, oh shit, engine's on fire. I know exactly what to do. Oh, co-pilot has a heart attack. I know exactly what to do. Oh, terrorist, sorry, stewardess, lovely stewardess turns out to be a malicious terrorist. Oh, I know exactly what to do. Okay, maybe not every situation here has a, an answer. <laughs> maybe the terrorist is from the stewardess is a bit of a stretch, but nevertheless, what if I buy at the low of the first negative bar? I will look at what happens when the second bar goes below the low of the first bar before doing anything else. And here it is, here's the statistic. I won't read every single one of them because I am trying to get through this presentation <sighs> to get to the, the juicy bit. <clears throat> My research has indicated that it does make sense to be a buyer. It may not look like it, but just allow me to show you the statistics, not just for these last 15 days, but for the last four and a half years worth of trading. This is what it looks like. If I buy the low of the first negative candle at the lows of the candle using a 10 point stop loss, I would have two losers, minus 10, minus 10. The third one, I'm just able to move my stop loss up to break even before I get stopped out. Then I have a max 43 FTSE points at a, at a maximum. I'm not saying I'm, a, I'm you, can't, you can't interpret that as, oh, plus 40 fee. No, 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 no. This is the absolute maximum that the market will give you. But what I haven't factored in here, ladies and gentlemen, is that you adding to your winner. Haven't done that at all. Max 43, max 40, max 45, max 25, max 17, then another loser, and max 40. I, ha I will have minus 30 points in clear losses over free trades, and I will have a potential of plus 210 points over seven trades. This does not include the potential or risk if I add it to the winning trade. And for the sake of saving space, if I used a five point stop loss, I would have had four losers losing 20 points but with a max profit approximately 40 points lower than whatever this added up to, which I think is about 190. Okay, so can we conclude that if the first candle is negative, it makes sense to buy at the low of the first candle? Well, based on this relatively small sample, sample yes, it does. But now we are going to dive into the last four years. So I know I could have asked my programmer to go and do this for me. How many am I doing for time, by the way? 15 minutes. 15 minutes, brilliant. I could have asked my programmer to put my thoughts through a rigorous automating uh, testing process and probably would have saved me hundreds of hours. However, the reason why I do this manually is because the devil is in the detail. And an old school teacher taught me that from here, from he's actually present today. The devil is in the detail and the proof is in the eating of the pudding. In other words, by going through this manually, I was able to discover aspects of trading that I never would have dreamt of that a programmer would find for me. So, what did I find? Okay, out of 1,049 charts, I found 523 charts that had a positive candle. I simply dismissed them for research of another day. Not this time around. That left me with, and by the way, that's 50% of all outcomes. So there was 523 um, candles with a positive candle, and then there was 526 that had a negative first candle. And I went through every single one of them, every single one of them. As I said, if the opening candle is negative, I'll deploy one of two strategies. I'll buy at the low, of the five minute candle, and if a subsequent candle offer me a price that's better, I'll take it. So I will try and buy down here. If the low was 7386, I'm gonna try and get 7386 or better. Now there's an important point here. I will gauge this to be a success if I'm able to move my stop loss up for whatever stop loss that I've decided, be it five points or 10 points or 20 points, I will move my stop loss up the moment that the FTSE has moved five points in my favor. And I judge that to be a success. 
So out of the 1,049 charts, 526 had at its first candle over the last four years, 526 of them. If I used, and we are getting to the real hardcore now, ladies and gentlemen, if I had used a 20 point stop loss, I would have a success rate of 64.6%. And I would have had a failure rate of 35%. Now what I've done is I've gone through every single chart with a profitable outcome and I made a note of how much the FTSE went against you if I bought the low or shorted the high. So out of those 340 charts that respected the 20 point loss, the stop loss, I actually wanted to find out, do I want to spend 20 point stop loss on the FTSE? Do I really want to risk 20 points every single time? How about I optimize it? And the only way that I could do that was to go through every single one of these 340 charts. And that's what I'd like to share with you now. For each of the 340 charts with a profitable outcome, I manually looked at how much the trade moved against me and how much I could have made with perfect hindsight. I created a spreadsheet, and that's what you're seeing here. Here we go. Uh, I would like to just credit uh, Andy, uh, who sat down here. He actually helped me with this chart. This is the profit potential. This is how much these trades went against me, and this is the profit potential that they offered me. If it's a little clear, unclear, and I don't think this is so clear, so I think I'm going to uh, move to the next slide. I want to break it down for you slightly different. Out of those 340 charts, but again now out of a sample space, out of a total of the entire, because <clears throat> I don't know whether it's going to be one of those trades that will actually points. It means that 526 out of 520 out of 526 trades, I would be stopped out on 526 minus 146, whatever that is. Was that 380? I would lose 380 times or Three times out of four. Doesn't sound very appealing, does it? But this is not an amateur seminar where some YouTube phenomenon is standing on a stage trying to sell you a strategy with a 90% success rate. No, hell, 100% success rate. You're never wrong. This is how a professional trader navigates risk with the actual data laid out in front of him or her, I will have a certain 1140 points lost over four and a half years, but I have a potential of 4,000 points. If you then increase the stop loss to six points, well, obviously you're going to lose more when you lose. So now, you're going to lose 1,944 for certain, but you have a potential of 5,100. And if you use 10 point stop loss, you'll lose more. When you lose, you'll lose 2,400 over four years, but you have a potential of 7,200. I won't go through the rest. But as you can see, they center very beautifully around a max profit potential of about 25 points. So if you're puzzled why all of a sudden I add to my FTSE trades like a maniac in my Telegram channel, it is because I know statistically we should get a 25, 28 point runner. And if I have bought the FTSE with a six or eight point stop loss, 
and I am now into the point where I'm breaking even, and I add every five points, well, all of a sudden, that, if I get a 25-point runner, well, I'm going to get 25 points profit on one, I'm going to get 20 points profit on the second, that's 45, I'm going to get 15 points on the third, that's 60, and if I'm able to move my stop loss by the time that you get to 25 points, you have actually clocked up three times as much in open profit. It won't take many of those days to actually make a market difference in your trading performance by adding to your winning trades, but do it with some statistical finesse actually knowing what lies behind the number. If you just had a 340 out of the 526, you're going to get a 64% hit rate. 64% is not bad, is it? Is, is, I mean, uh, you know, if I was talking to some 20-year-old that is used to YouTube videos, and he's 64%, he'd probably go, well, that's not very good. There's a guy down the road, he does 95%. You know, but that's not the company now I'm in here, is it? We, we are not those people. We're professionals, and we know how to deal with statistics if the statistics is presented to us. So how do you feel about having what's basically a two-to-one ratio? You will lose 3,720 FTSE points over a year, but you will have a potential of 8,700. So I put here, how much would you have to make on the 202 winnings if you had a six point stop loss? Well, on average, you would have to make nine points to counteract the ravages of the losses. All of this is available in the manual that is being given to you. So say we had a strategy that we always bought the FTSE as close to the first candle low as, uh, with a negative candle as possible. What would that look like from a loss-making point of view? Well, that's 526 trades. There's 340 winners and 186 losers. In order to break even on this strategy, we need to make 10 points. So you'll have a 20 point stop loss. You need to make 10.9, call it 11 points on average. But what is the potential usually? Well, actually, on average, you're going to get 25 points. How am I doing for time, Steve? Is it getting close to your time? OK. So. I then, it's, it's getting heavy. I know it's getting heavy. I also discovered something which I thought worth mentioning. Can we agree that when you have a negative candle, we actually anticipate the market to follow through? We anticipate that the low to be broken of that five minute candle, unless of course it's one of those negative candles that just closes like a, a hammer. I counted 32 times out of the 186 charts when the second, third, or fourth candle broke above the high of the first candle. And there was none of those 32 times when the FTSE didn't go above by enough to move the stop loss to break even. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, we really have to think very carefully about whether we want to short at the high of a negative candle. If the first candle is negative, we have to think very carefully. I'll get to that in just a second. If I flip this argument on its head, what happens if I sell short at the high of the first candle? As I said, I went through 364 charts manually, and I was right to think that the odds of breaking through the low was much more likely than breaking through the high first. I calculated only 80 instances out of 364 when the FTSE broke through the high first, and 284 cases where the FTSE broke through the low first. This is the percentage allocation. I then looked at how much the market would move against me if I shorted the highs. This is what I found. 67 times out of 80, the market moved against me by less than 10 points. In other words, if you have a negative candle as the first candle of the morning in the FTSE, and 
it's one of those mornings where the FTSE then actually goes above the high first. In 67, sorry, 83% of the cases, the FTSE will only move against you by less than 10 points. And 59 out of the 80 trades moved against me by less than seven points. And 46 out of 80, it moved against me by less than five points. It's heavy statistics, I know, I know. I could have come here and I could have done many other things, but I wanted to give you something that was of real lasting value. And if you can sit through a two hour lecture with me, throwing statistics at you, you can do this in trading as well. This is what it looks like graphically. Again, thank you to you, Andy, for producing this. But this leads me to a real conundrum. Do I buy the low of the first candle, which produces high setups like this? Isn't that just a beautiful one? Isn't it just beautiful to be a buyer down there? And then you ride that? Yeah, see, now you come to life, because now it's visual. <laughs> No, I, I, don't, I get it. I absolutely get it. It's also a part and parcel of the, of, the, of the person up here on a stage to try and make it entertaining. But there's only so much you can do with statistics. I mean, I can stand here like a parrot or a clown and trying to make it entertaining. But I actually really want to get to is, this is going to happen 125 days out of a trading year. Wouldn't it be absolutely amazing that you knew exactly what you were dealing with and the odds of success? Because it doesn't take many of these days to make an absolute killer difference on your account. This is the kind of day where you're hoping that you buy down here and you have the good sense of just putting a stop loss at breaking even and then the market is just allowed to run. Why? Well, because you know that there's a statistical charge, you're going to get at least 25 points. And then maybe when you get to 25 points, you're thinking, I'm just gonna leave that running. I'm actually gonna do myself a favor, and I'm gonna go and play a round of golf, and then let's just see where we are in an hour's time. I'll put my stop loss at, so I get at least 10 points, whatever it may be. Or something like this. where we're buying right here, and there's very quick 20 points. Or something like this, where the market just goes and goes and goes and goes. What, because you risked 10 points here, and you are rewarded with, well, whatever the market will offer you. And sometimes it's less. So, is, these, are the, is this what I'm going to go for? Or do I play for this, trying to sell short the break, below the first negative bar and get results like this. You see, this is the flip side. And you might be thinking, oh, you F-U-C-K-E-R, why are you doing that to me? Well, because that's what we need to be able to deal with. We need to be able to know when the market is doing this, it reverses, or when it's doing things like this. And that is what I've attempted to answer in the PowerPoint presentation, a PDF file. Because right here, if you bought here, you would obviously have a loser. You would have a losing trade. But wouldn't it be nice to have that kind of knowledge of how often this happens, and then at some point you will be able to join this trend? And if you're looking for something like this, I have something that I have uncovered in this, so I'm just going to skip through these a little bit because how long have I got, Steve? <laughs> Great. Okay. Would you mind if I just finish this passage? Okay. I'm going to free flow for a second. Okay. You know what I mean by free flow? No notes. So I am doing all of this research, and Lord knows, it's funny to say Lord knows because I'm not actually a believer, but hey, <laughs> forgive me. Maybe I am. <laughs> I refer to him often enough. He must be thinking, I have doubts about whether you really are an atheist or not. You talk to me, you talk about me so often. Lord knows I spent many hours on this. Are you sh me? 
And you know when you, you have a bit of an epiphany in life? Me, it was an epiphany being in a hotel conference room with David Paul in 2007, and he said to me, add to your winning trades. You know, and like a, like a good boy, I added to my trades, and it's really made a difference in my financial life. Well, as I was sitting going through the, the FTSE, something occurred to me. And this is about half a year ago. I'm thinking, hmm, surely that was a coincidence. I realized, sorry, I discovered that the eighth bar and the 13th bar and the FTSE seem to hold some rather valuable properties along the lines of school run. And I'd like to show you so you, you don't think I'm just fibbing here. I went through every single one of the 526 samples and I investigated how often is the eighth candle, if I bracket the eighth candle like I did with a school run bar, how often will I make money if I bought above the high or I shorted below the low? And the same with the 13th candle. And I'd like to just show you uh, what I found. Uh, so here's the, there's the, the eighth candle. If you bought above there, then you would have nothing but fresh air above. I'm sure you'd be very happy. And if you, if you follow the 13th, well, you wouldn't do too badly. I judge a strategy success rate on something like this on how am I able to move my stop loss up for break even and just leave it. If I get stopped out, well, I don't lose anything. But what I would really like to do is I'd love to show you. There again, there's the, the, uh, the eighth bar. It means I'm short here. And here's the 13th bar. Well, it means I would be going long here. But what I would like to show you is I would really like to show you the last 22 trading days in the FTSE. Because now it's not dependent on whether the, the FTSE is positive or negative. Just humor me for a second. As I go through the last 22 trading days of the FTSE index, and before you ask, I try to make this ingenious little thing work in the DAX. Absolutely doesn't work. And I don't understand why it works. But what I'm about to show you is the last month in the FTSE index where I bracket the eighth and the 13th bar. And I ask you, do you think you could have made money from that? Are you ready? And then we'll give the stage to Steve Waugh. I would have made money from that because I'll have a stop loss up here. I would have made money from that. I would have been a buyer here. I definitely was able to move my stop loss up. I would have been a buyer here. Oh, a bit of heartache and happy. Would I have been able to make money from bracketing the eighth bar on this day? I certainly would. Decent trade, decent trade. I've been long there, bit of heartache, happy days. What I like about the way I present is that I don't hand pick. I take a full month and I'll show you everything, good or bad. These might not be enormous winners, but they are enough to make your points every single day. Here's one that lost. So here it wins. Do you see this one here? Do you see how I would short here and the market will certainly stop me out? That was one. This works. This works. This one doesn't work. Do you see how it will take me long here and then stop me out here? But this one works. This one works because I can move my stop loss up to break even. I may not make money on it, but I will get stopped for nothing. This one will give me some heartache, and then it will make me. This one will make me. This one here. I may actually have some, some money management to do here. 
But down here, I am able to move the stop loss because it moved five points with me. This one here, I'll have 20 minutes of hell. And then I'll have about 13 points in profit. This one here is very iffy, but it just about works. And this one here was a beautiful call. I traded this yesterday afternoon, sorry, yesterday morning. Why it works, I don't know. Even this one here, it may not look like a lot, but it's enough by five points to move the stop loss, and then I would certainly get stopped out for nothing. And the same here. Not a lot in it here, but enough for me to move my stop loss. And then what I'm constantly hoping for, ladies and gentlemen, is to get runners. Always hoping to get runners. Move my stop loss and just hope. This is the 13th bar. Why the 13th bar? In my opinion, because the 13th bar is one hour into trading. And I believe that that could be the reason why they trade from eight to nine, and then once maybe business is done by nine o'clock, and maybe all of a sudden it will present opportunity. I'll do these very quickly, and then we'll give Steve Ward the stage. This one, oh, <clears throat> this one wasn't very good, but you don't get you don't get short here but if you use a point offset and then you have a beautiful trade here. Beautiful trade, beautiful trade, a loser, a beautiful trade, beautiful trade, a loser, an absolute stonker of a trade offering approximately 30 points in the FTSE. Okay. Um, that was the first part of my FTSE research. I will now give the stage to Steve Ward. Steve, do you have a PowerPoint or do you want to take your laptop? Yeah, okay. Are you still awake? Oh, bless you. Oh. Do, do you remember? Do you remember I said this was either the best idea ever or the worst? See, I just felt like, oh my God, this is heavy, and I realize it's heavy. But at the end of the day, what I'm hoping is that you're going to walk away from here and going, actually, this has real value going forward. Okay, so some of you may know me, some probably won't. I'm not as famous as Tom. Um, most of my work actually intentionally has to be behind or oh, I guess under the radar, um, a lot of my clients, I've probably signed more NDAs in the last 18 years than any other document in my life. But my clients typically are um, world's largest hedge funds, investment banks, commodities trading houses, many traders, you'll, if you read the financial press, you'll know of many, you won't know of many of the best traders don't like to be in the press if they are, generally they've done something wrong, which is not good news. Um, and what I try and do for my clients is help them to essentially make better decisions and to navigate the challenges of trading the markets, the highs and the lows. I've been doing that for 18 and a half years, uh, working with traders all over the world, all different asset classes, 95% um, of the time. Thank you. <laughs> is uh, institutional and then obviously got some good friends and colleagues like Tom where I like to come and if I get invited um, to come and get my little slot to maybe share some um, advice and guidance. The one thing I always say when I'm working with anybody is there's no seven steps, there's no five steps, there's no three magic qualities. Um, that sells books, it gets people on courses, but it doesn't make anybody better at what they do. And the reason for that is because nobody in this room is like anybody else in this room. 
I say that I was looking around for some twins, but that's, that's, my norm, <laughs> that's the normal sticking point. I hadn't seen any earlier. So. Um, but even they are not identical, even when they are identical. So we have to recognize that part of becoming a successful trader is shaping your own process. You've got to find out how to make it work for you. It won't be the same as for everybody else. And that's probably the most important um, piece of guidance I can give anybody is you start like everyone else does. You go on some courses. Sorry. No problem. No problem. It's fine. And then over time, you've got to work it out for yourself. But the key thing in working it out for yourself is work. You've got to do the work. There's no one I work with who's good at what they do. And by good, I would say we're talking about people that are world class who hasn't put in a large amount of work. Doing the analysis, doing the work at the screens, time at the screens, and also working on themselves. What I want to try and share today is just a few ideas, also some techniques that I utilize with my clients to help them really, I guess, to do what Tom's been trying to say is to close the gap between knowing and understanding what to do in any given moment and then being able to actually do that in some form. So we might call that a consistency. So it's interesting for you to think about how consistent you might actually be with your own trading. So when you see opportunities set up that you should be taking, how many of them roughly do you take? If you should be taking them in a certain amount of risk on those trades, how often do you take the actual risk that your strategy suggests you should be taking? Exits, do you get out when you should be getting out? If you should be adding to your winners, are you adding to your winners? Are you able to stay out of the market when you shouldn't be in the market? That's also consistency. Inaction is action. Everything is action. Everything is behavior. The thing also about consistency is we have to be careful with any of these ideas that we don't get too attached to it. Because the paradox is you need to be flexibly consistent. Because the market is made up, as is life, of many moments, some which are familiar and similar, but very few are identical. And so part of what I'm going to talk about today, and it ties in with what Tom's been talking about, Tom calls it situational, and in psychology we call it context, which is the situation a person is in. To understand behavior, we've got to understand the situation the person was in when they were doing the behavior. And we can only judge a behavior um, and in, in my brand of psychology, we don't talk about right, wrong, good, bad. We talk about, is it useful? Is it helpful? And if you think about in trading, for example, a very simple example, if you have a trending market versus a ranging market, it's quite likely the behaviors that we engage in might look quite different because the context of the market is different. And there can be different types of trends. And we might have different behaviors. So some flexibility is quite important, understanding the situation, the context, and what's required in that context. And what the best traders that I work with are very good at is what we call context sensitivity, or market regime sensitivity. They understand the nuances of what's going on in the markets and how to adapt their behavior to maximize the opportunities in that context, or sometimes to stay out of the markets because they know it's not their particular regime where they've got strengths or opportunities. So when we think about how consistent we are, consistency is a nice word, it's what we call a mid-level term. We all kind of understand what it means. But consistency is going to be different. Over the course of a year, if we just did exactly the same thing all of the time, what we would call rigidity, we probably wouldn't maximize our market returns. Because not every behavior is going to work in every set of conditions. And we might choose to be rigid, knowing that over time, we win more than we lose. And when we win, we win more than we lose when we lose. So we have a positive expectancy. So we may make that choice. But we might also want to have a bit of flexibility, recognizing different contexts, and flexing and adapting to those different contexts. 
Now, all of us who have traded will realize that often if we look back and analyze our performance, we might get a gap between what our system might suggest we could return from the market and what we actually do return. And the reason for that gap is normally behavior, what we did in those moments. Okay, so all of you will have a behavioral gap. So it's interesting to think about you know, how big that gap might be for each of you. For some traders, it might be quite narrow. For some, it can be very wide. And also, we can start to think about, and what specific behaviors might it be that is creating my gap? Are there particular behaviors that I know I engage in which are reducing my returns from the market? So that's what we've got to kind of start with. And then we can think about, okay, and how would it be if I was more consistent? If I was able to do that behavior on a more consistent basis, what would the outcome be in my um, returns? And, of course, then what do I need to do about it? How can I start to change this behavior? Okay. Now, when I'm working with clients, we're often talking about trying to bridge the gap. All of my clients, like all of you, want to maximize market returns, fundamentally. That's a goal, whether it's in P&L terms or in other terms. Now, there are four building blocks we can think about in terms of where this gap might be coming from. The first one we have to think about is process. Because some people's behavioral gap is down to the fact they don't have a clearly defined process. For some people, the behavioral gap is also process related. They don't have any confidence in their process. They don't know if from moment to moment and or over time, that strategy has any kind of positive expectancy. They're diving off a diving board into a pool. They don't know how deep that pool is. For other people, and this links into the second point, they may have a strategy that's clear. It may have some positive expectancy, but it may not suit them as a person. So the strategy itself may work for some people, and it may be able to be clearly defined, but not all strategies work for all people. And if you have to trade out of line with your personality, that is difficult to sustain over time, and it's definitely difficult to do when there's stress and pressure, and we tend to revert back to type. So we want to make sure we've got a process, we understand the process, we want confidence, we want clarity, and then we want what we call congruence. We ideally want that, that um, strategy to be related to who we are as people. Some people are very risk-seeking by nature, they love uh, novelty, they love discomfort, they want to get in, get involved, the bigger the better. And for other people, they're the exact opposite. They're very risk and uncertainty sensitive. They're cautious, they're careful. And I've got traders, world-class traders, who fit both of those categories. And when I look at their trading styles and how they make the money they make, it is very different. Both make exceptional sums of money in different ways, in different markets that suit them. And that's part of the working out how you become successful. You've got to do it your way. Then we get to this kind of the underlay. And I, I noticed, and I was interested to hear Tom talking about his, you know, the sleep and diet. Um, I've done lots of research with my clients around the physiology, the role of the body in risk-taking and decision-making, and it is um, very highly correlated. But we need to consider things like you know, our level of fatigue. If you're fatigued, you will make different decisions to when you're not fatigued. We all know that. I've got hundreds of bits of data to show it in trading scenarios. If you are highly stressed, it will affect how you perceive risk, how you make decisions, and the results you get. And your physiology will underpin your psychology. People who are sleep deprived are significantly more emotionally reactive than those who have slept well. So we have to think about the physiology. In, in performance, we have a phrase called bio-psychosocial. When we think about what drives performance, bio, biological, psycho, psychological, and then social, i.e. often, like for my clients, we'll be working in a trading team, in an organization, what are the environmental influences? 
And then we've got the psychological piece. So maybe we've got a process, maybe it aligns to our personality, maybe we're looking after our physiology. We also need to think about the psychology, thoughts, emotions, where we're focused, so cognition, emotion, and all of these processes, and the part they're playing in this gap. So it's useful for you to be thinking about, as a framework, if you've got a gap, where is the gap coming from? Because I've sometimes had people come to me claiming some psychological challenge, and when we go back and we look at actually what's going on, it's a process challenge. Yeah, if you don't believe in your process, if you've got no confidence in it, if it's not aligned to your personality, you can get lots of anxiety and stress and frustration and ill discipline, but it's not a psychology issue. It's a psychological reaction to poor process. Yeah. So you can use this as just a bit of a self-assessment. Assess the level of your process. You can think about, does it, th think about in life in general, how do you like to make decisions? I've got, a, well, a, he was a head of risk at a big hedge fund. I can say a little bit, but not too much. But we were doing some risk profiling. And he came out as adventurous in, in our kind of categorization which is quite interesting for the head, head of risk in a hedge fund. Um, but I, I often say to people, you know, tell me about how you plan a holiday. Think about how you like to plan holidays. Here's what he does. He says, I pick an interesting country I've never been to before. I pick an interesting city that I can fly to in that country. I book a flight and I book one night's accommodation in the city that I'm going to arrive in. And then it unfolds from there. That isn't how I plan my holidays. I like to do plenty of research, take my time, plan, consider, look at alternatives, prices. It's a much more thoughtful, deliberate process. I don't want the risk of being in a bad hotel or being in an unsafe city or not knowing where I'm going to be sleeping on day two. That's uncomfortable for me. For him, that's what it's all about. The thought of spending months planning a holiday with minimal risk or excitement would be the worst thing for him. So we can think about in our lives, how do we like to make decisions is an insight into our risk personality. Does that align with how you're trying to trade? So we can do a bit of research. We can think about physiological. How are you managing sleep? Are you rested, as rested as can be before you trade? eating, hydration, etc. But today we're going to focus particularly on the psychology piece because that's what Tom's asked me to do. But I am always thinking about these four parts because when people are making decisions and they're taking risk in the markets, it's these four things interplaying together. Yeah? We can't always assume it's one or the other. We need to kind of have that, the four pieces in our mind. So what we'll do today is we'll focus on the psychology. All of you that have traded and traded live, I think that's probably most of you know, it's pretty challenging trading live. It's not easy. And this is a piece, this is, I'm, I'm going to read it because it might not be clear to everybody in the room. But this came from uh, a podcast interview uh, with Will England. He's the CEO and CIO of Walleye Capital. So he said, the job of being a PM, portfolio manager, whether you're quantitative or fundamental, is psychologically extremely toxic. Because you're going to be wrong basically just as much as you're going to be right. You're going to get kicked in the face a lot. And you're going to be someone who's the smartest person that they've known their entire life. And then they're going to just get beat up all the time. Now, I'll pause there. And I just, this graph on the left-hand side is some data of high-performing fund managers collected by a company called Essentia Analytics. They collect data from a large number of, of funds. They analyze portfolio manager detail. And what it basically shows us, if you go across horizontally, we've got hit rate. So how often is the person right? And then we've got payoff ratio. So how much do you make when you are right versus how much you lose when you're wrong going vertically. The most interesting thing, obviously, straight away is the fact, if we look at it, there is a very tight grouping. And that range of hit rate in this data is between 45 and 55%. So the best performing world-class fund manager in this group is right about 55% of the time. And other people in this group, also world-class, are only right 45% of the time. But obviously we can see that some, the big outperformers, 
make a lot of money when they're right and minimize losses when they're wrong. Yeah, it's so what Tom was alluding to earlier. And that's the skill that we have to kind of work on. But becoming a top performing portfolio manager, and then he goes on to say, takes a certain psychological profile, and that requires training. And I just don't think many humans are wired that way. And this goes back, and I think Tom uses a phrase in, in his book um, about thinking differently. I think Mark Douglas, one of the first people probably to kind of bring that phrase about the best traders thinking differently to the rest. Lots of our human instincts, our biological responses are not the ones that are conducive to making money in the long term in financial markets. So we've got to be doing the work on our strategies, we've got to do the work on our skills, and we've got to do the work on ourself. Yeah. The good news is we can rewire. So if we're not wired correctly, we can rewire. One of my favorite examples of this is, so what he's really saying here is, psychologically, trading is tough. Most of us probably go, yeah, that's probably true. But actually, then if we go to the Navy SEALs, we go, okay, well, actually, Navy SEAL selection is also really tough. And what Navy SEALs select for initially, particularly, is fitness. A large part of selection is about how physically fit you are. A large part of trading might be about process. But to get to the end of selection, what they realized was, and this is true in all special operations, it's not just physical. And a large proportion of it is actually mental. And in trading, we may think it's all about having a great process, but it's not. It's also largely mental, psychological. And so when the SEALs realized that they were losing people based on physical testing, but who with different psychological skills might have got through those tests, they were faced with a choice. Either we keep things as they are, or we do something different. We start teaching Navy SEALs psychological skills to enable them to pass the physical tests so we get a higher output of candidate per selection group. And that's what they did. They identified the skills that were required, and then they taught them. People learned them, and selection rates went higher without any falling quality of candidate. And we can use the same thing in trading. If we know that it's psychologically toxic, difficult, challenging, we can use our own language. The question is, is it possible to learn the skills required and to rewire? And the answer is yes. It is, if we are willing to do the work to do the rewiring, of course. And a large part of my work when I'm working with clients is helping them to understand more about themselves and kind of those four component pieces and where we can improve and optimize. But when it gets into the psychology piece, often we're trying to identify, you know, what can we do differently? How do we need to think differently? Or how do we need to respond differently to when you're having those emotions whilst you're trading? And I want to kind of share a few thoughts and ideas um, around that in our session today. So, a large part of my work over the last probably 10 years um, has been helping traders to develop something called psychological flexibility. And I, I picked this particularly because I think it, it overlays really nicely with what Tom's um, talking about today. So the definition, again, just so I know a few of you might find it hard to read the screen, people's ability to focus on their current situation, what's happening in the markets as I see them right now. And then based upon the opportunities afforded by that situation, take appropriate action. So do the right thing for the situation you are in, even in the presence of challenging or unwanted psychological events. The reality of trading is quite often you may have to take action, even though you're feeling some doubt or you're a bit anxious or you've got a slight sense of a fear of losing on that trade. And I was chatting to somebody before the session, and something I think is worth sharing is, I think a lot of people in their mind, and maybe it's how some of the early books were written, or maybe it's just popular culture, there's almost an expectation, even in my institutional clients, that at some point in their career, they will get to a point where suddenly they're trading without fear. There's no anxiety. There's no stress. There's no worry. 
they're confident all the time. It comes naturally and easily. And it's almost like there's a hope that there's this point in the future when that will happen. And what happens, it doesn't happen. And some of my clients have been in the markets for 25, 30 years plus. They still get some fear, they still get anxious, they still worry, they still lack confidence, they still find drawdown painful. Of course they do, because who wouldn't? It is painful. But what they have learned over the years is how to manage it. So we have to accept this is part of the normal trading experience, part of what I would call the trading condition. There's ups and downs in life, that's a human condition. There's ups and downs in trading, a lot of them, that's a trading condition. You can't change it, and actually trying to hope it goes away is unhelpful, because it isn't going to go away. There's a good analogy, a guy called John Kabat-Zinn, who's a mindfulness meditation practitioner, has this great metaphor about that um, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf them. And that's exactly how I think about the trading experience. You can't stop the emotions. You can't turn them off. You can't turn off the thoughts. It's not how we're wired. They come. For some people stronger, for others weaker, for some more often, for some less. But it, it happens. But you can learn how to manage those thoughts, how to manage those emotions, how to manage the urges, how to manage the memories, the images that all pop up. You can learn to manage that such that it doesn't get in the way of us taking the action we need to take. Time for a little experiment. I want you to put your hand in the air. OK. I'm going to demonstrate the experiment, then you can do it for yourself. Now, are you all good? OK. So just watch, and then you can have a go yourself. Listen to what I'm saying, and watch what I do. Keep your hand up, keep your hand up, keep your hand up, keep your hand up. Have a go. OK, watch again. Keep your hand up, keep your hand up, keep your hand up, keep your hand up. <laughs> no wonder Tom's tired teaching you lot all the time. Watch again. OK. Keep your hand up, keep your hand up, keep your hand up, keep your hand up. There's two things we're doing, yeah? I'm keeping it simple. There's two tasks. One is verbal, one is physical action. One is this, and one is this. Keep your hand up, keep your hand up, keep your hand up. Put them both together. Keep your hand up, keep your hand up, keep your hand up, keep your hand up. OK, good. Next level. Advanced. Watch. Keep your hand down, keep your hand down, keep your hand down, keep your hand down. Have a go. OK, great. So. Here's what's interesting. I hear from people quite often, I had the thought, and let's say, for example, maybe it's, I can't afford to take a loss on this trade. And so I stayed in the trade. I had the thought that told me, basically, I can't take the loss on the trade. And that thought made me stay in the trade. Or I might hear, I had a really strong feeling of FOMO. So I got into the, the market, even though I knew it wasn't the right time to get in. But I felt it, and I acted on the feeling. I thought it, and it made me act in a certain way. And this has been a misconception from cognitive psychology, where we see diagrams such as thought leads to action or feeling, action or thought, feeling, action. And we think that's how it is. It isn't like that at all. Because if that was true, how could you do this? Keep my hand up, keep my hand up, keep my hand up, keep my hand up. Wouldn't be possible. But that's opposing action to thought. And we need to remember this, because just because you're having the thought that you can't afford to take a loss on a trade, it doesn't mean you have to stay in the trade. You could have the thought that I can't afford or I don't want to lose on this trade. And at the same time, you could get out of the trade. You can have the feeling of the fear of missing out. It doesn't mean you have to jump into the market. You can have the feeling of the fear of missing out and stay out of the market, providing you've got the psychological skills to be able to do so, of course. Yeah? And that's what I want to try and give you a bit of today. So 
this is really important. It's a key part of my work because I think a lot of trading situations happen where if you're going to maximize returns and you want to be consistent, for many people, it's the thoughts and emotions that are showing up that are influencing too strongly the behavior. And the thoughts and feelings that show up might be perfectly normal. This year has been tough for a lot of my clients. Early part of the, of the year, particularly first six months, seven months, a lot of hedge funds in drawdown, some, some, some significant ones. Choppy markets, difficult. Lots of thoughts, lots of doubts, lots of worries showing up, minds going crazy. But each day you've got to still come in and do the right things, even though you're in drawdown, even though it's uncomfortable, even though you're doubting yourself, you've still got to come in and do what you need to do, execute the process. Yeah. So consistency of behavior, of what the visible behavior, is often having to occur, even though there might be internal thoughts and feelings that might be trying to sway us away from that. Yeah. So this is where we need our psychological skills. So, I want to break it into three core component pieces. There's, it, it's more nuanced than this, but I've, you know, I've, Tom has given me an hour, which is pretty decent. Um, so, here are the three skills. We'll talk through them, and we'll actually do some of the skills as we go through. You may be doing some of these things already. If so, great. You can obviously just use them as a reminder. Some things may be new. Some things might be very new, um, things that you've not, never done before or considered, and you can always think about going away and trying them out. Okay? So, the first component of being psychologically flexible is actually commitment. So here's a question for you before I explain more. I want you to think about the type of trader that you want to be. And I ask this to all of my clients. Tell me about the type of trader or the type of portfolio manager or analyst that you want to be or that you are trying to be. Just in your mind, think about how are you trying to be? Think about some of the qualities you might be wanting to demonstrate. So for one of my clients, phenomenal trader, young guy, probably late 20s now, when we did this exercise, he said, OK, it's really important for me to be focused. OK, great. Focused as a trader. Then he said, I want to have a word that's kind of learning based. In the end, he came for kind of being sort of, he chose mastery. This kind of sense of kind of learning, continuing to kind of continually improvement, keeping going. That was another one he chose. He said, I want to choose calm. So choose whichever ones you want. It's how do you want to be as a trader? And then he said, aggressive, in brackets, when needed, close brackets, contextual. Not aggressive all the time, but when I need to be aggressive, be aggressive. But that's important how he wants to be. Okay? So that's in his mind, we're creating here's how you want to be, here's the qualities that you want to bring. And then you need to be connected to that either daily or weekly based on your time frames. But we need to keep that in mind. Who am I trying to be? What are the qualities I want to demonstrate? Because when it's difficult, when we get to part three, when we get down to being willing to be uncomfortable, for what? If we want our mind and body to be uncomfortable, the first thing they will ask us in return is, why? Because the psychological default in the brain around comfort discomfort is comfort first. Discomfort where required. So if you don't know why you want to be uncomfortable, if you've not got a sense of purpose, a goal, purpose, the trader you want to be, there's no commitment to anything, then there's no purpose, then the brain will be resistant to you being uncomfortable. So we have to balance, at least balance, discomfort with some sense of purpose. And I say, in my model, we tend to look at kind of how that trader wants to be. They find it a nice way of thinking about things. So think about that for yourself. How do you want to be? And you might have some themes that are consistent, and you might have some where you want to be certain ways in certain different conditions. Aggressive, in brackets, where required, when needed. It's like rooms in a house. Some rooms we use regularly, some rooms in a house we go to when we need to, but less frequently. Yeah? That's how we can think about these qualities. Now, what I want you to do is, if you've done that exercise just quickly in your mind, you've maybe got a few ideas about how you want to be. Think about one of those 
So if I take from my client, we might take um, his idea, let's take the mastery idea, being masterful. It's okay doing the first part and knowing how you want to be, but there's no value alone to that until you do the second part, which is, and what does it look like in practice? And this is where we start to add into our trading process. So for my client, the, his quality of being masterful, what does that look like for him? Well, A, he has coaching every single month. We check in via email every single week, sometimes twice a week. We're always talking about trading, about performance, looking for ways to improve. He asks me regularly what I'm reading so he can read as well. He does online training courses, even though he's already phenomenally successful. He mentors other people, but much like Tom was saying, also for the joy of mentoring, but also that it keeps him accountable. So he's doing a whole number of things that reflect that. Now, he does them consistently, not because he read them in a book, not because I told him, you must adopt the value of being masterful. He chose that. It's important to him. It's how he wants to be, and he's committed to being that way, and then he is more consistent with the behaviour. He wanted to be more aggressive. He chose that. It's a way that he wanted to be, that he cared about, that mattered to him. He's made that choice. He thought about when he needs to be aggressive, what it looks like, and he's committed to doing that in practice. And he's been very consistent. He's got clarity, not just about the trading process, how he wants to be while he's trading the process. Yeah. And that's powerful, because when you're in a difficult moment, you can return back down to, how do I need to be in this moment? How do I need to be today as a trader? What qualities am I going to bring? Second part, focus. Two levels of focus, external and internal. So a little exercise we can do together. First of all, I want you to have a look around the room and find three things in the room that you have not noticed until this point in time. So three new things in the room. Okay, now have a little listen. Three sounds. Okay, now just tune in to your breathing for a moment and just bring in awareness. Just notice maybe just the speed or the rhythm of your breathing at the moment. In breath versus out breath. Take a moment now just to notice maybe what thoughts are in your mind. What am I thinking right now? Take a moment to notice just how you're feeling. Could be emotionally, could be physically. Okay. So, we did external awareness, seeing, hearing, and we brought some attention inwards, yeah? And we want to have both. Both are trainable, things like mindfulness, meditation training, awareness training, attention training, journaling. These are all processes that we can do that can train and rewire our level of focus. Why is it important? One, the first part, external awareness, is when you're sitting in front of your screen, that's external awareness. Your ability to recognise patterns, to see context, to recognise context changes is external awareness. The better Sorry, the higher, the better. Okay? In that context, we also need to work out what's the effective action. And WIN is just what's important now. What's important now. So in any given moment, in this moment right now, for me as a presenter, there are some things that are really important and others that are completely irrelevant. And all I need to worry about is what's important now. And... Some experience, hopefully some element of skill and practice, allow me to determine what's important now. But I might still find thoughts and emotions showing up that I need to manage and bring my attention back to what's important now. 
And then the internal awareness is critical because if we're not aware of a thought we're having, how can we manage it? What will happen is you'll have that thought, you'll act on the thought, you'll do a behaviour which seems to be unhelpful, then you'll realise it's unhelpful, then you'll work backwards and go, oh, why did I do this? Oh, that's because the market was doing this and I had this thought and that's why I did it. And you might journal it or you might not, you might learn from it or you might not, but you're still going to be in the same situation in the future until the level of awareness increases. Or you have an emotion, and then you act out the emotion, and you do the behaviour, you get the outcome of the behaviour, and then you try and track back as to why it happened. What we want to develop is the ability to notice what's happening as it's happening. I'm noticing in my mind this thought that I'm having about I need to stay in this trade. I can't afford to lose on this trade. And that's a thought a client told me about in a coaching session about three months ago, which led to his biggest ever career loss. Because he got very attached to the thought that he could not afford to lose money on this trade. And in the coaching session, of course, it unveiled itself that the thought made him lose money. No. Thoughts never made a trader lose money. Feeling never made a trader lose money. Because thoughts and feelings don't press the mouse. That's an action. So thoughts and feelings can influence those actions, but the thought or the feeling itself does not take the action. And again, that's a really important distinction we need to be making. If we're going to be trading consistently, because consistency is what's the visible behaviour I'm seeing and doing. So I can't, you know, when I look at your behaviour, I see it. When you look at your behaviour, obviously you're doing it. And the consistency of behaviour that we want to get is, is the action behaviour. Am I pressing the mouse, not pressing the mouse? When I press it, what am I pressing it for? That's the behaviour. But in amongst all that, the thoughts and feelings that are showing up could be very variable. Like the weather, some days ha happier, more positive, other days darker, more grey, wet and miserable. That's how we work. Thoughts and, and feelings, very reactive to the market, to experience. Transient, coming and going. And in amongst all that, that's inconsistent. Not a lot we can do about it happening to us. The behaviour piece is where we've got more controllability. Yeah, if we can kind of unplug from that. So we need this awareness, this internal awareness. The metaphor I often use is a river. Think about the river is your experience. When the river is calm, it's nice. You float along, all is good. And then we get into the rapids. Then we move into the grade three, four, five rapids. Now all you're doing now is struggling to keep your head above water and not drown. Can't admire the view. You can't even make good choices. You're literally just trying to survive. But imagine if you were in a helicopter above the river. The river can be calm, you can enjoy the calmness, you can enjoy the view. The river can be grade five rapids, you can be looking down at the grade five rapids, you can see it's pretty rough down there, but your perspective from here and ability to act, to respond, is very different. And that difference between being in or out of the experience is an awareness. It's focusing, this internal ability to notice. I'm having a thought, I'm having a feeling. So there's lots of research in neuroscience that when we put our feelings into words or we label them, it reduces the impact. Naming and taming is the common phrase in the psychology literature. So when I'm able to notice the feeling I'm having, put it into words to identify the feeling, which we often think actually will make it worse, it doesn't actually reduces the emotional hold over us. The goal in trading is not to get rid of emotions. The goal in trading is to maximise market returns. But to do that, we might need to be able to learn to have the emotions, but without those emotions having us. I can have the fear of missing out, I can have the fear of loss, I can have the fear of leaving money on the table, and I can still take the effective action if I'm sufficiently skilled. I can have doubts, worries, anxieties, I can have my ego screaming at me. I don't have to act on it. 
if I've got the psychological skills to be able to not act on it. Yeah. So the awareness is key. So we need some commitment. We need some awareness. And then we need, most importantly, to be willing to be uncomfortable. Quick exercise. Just everyone stand yourselves up for a minute. A little exercise. Slightly more challenging than the last one. So just prepare yourselves for it. If you've got any um, knee injuries or back injuries, then please be cautious. Um, or any other kind of injuries. You all look like sensible grown-ups, so just manage yourselves as you need to. So here's a little challenge. I want you to get into a little squatting position. You can go as far down or you can stay as high up as you want to go. Just, just, so, just so you know it's going to maybe be a little bit uncomfortable. Okay? It's not a competition. Some of you think it is, but it's not. <laughs> You can see a few of you settling into your gym squat positions. Okay. But, so all we're doing, okay, by adopting this squat, at some point, we all know, if we hold it for long enough, it's going to get uncomfortable. Okay. And then we're going to have some choices. Yeah. So we can all start to make some choices about whether maybe I might adjust my position, or maybe I just give up. Or maybe I go, no, actually, I'm going to just be with this for a little bit longer. How far can I go? Neither is right or wrong, by the way. These are just different choices we've got in the moment. And then I might say, actually, well, the person that holds this squat the longest gets 500 pound. <laughs> and just, I did say, I might say that, yeah? I might say that. Bring it on. It's hypothetical. Exactly. exactly. Now we're thinking, oh, actually, well, for 500 pound, maybe it's worthwhile suffering a bit more pain. And then we might get to that. A few of you might drop out and a few might stay. And I might go, actually, well, let's up the stakes. Let's make it 2,000. Then people go, do you know what? Actually, oh, yeah, for 2,000, I'll, I'll take a lot more pain. Just yeah? Okay. So we're balancing, aren't we? How much discomfort for what reason? To take part in you know, one of Steve's crazy exercises I don't really understand, or for 500 quid, or for 2,000, or whatever it might be. So we're starting the brain, we're now we're thinking about, okay, for what am I willing to be uncomfortable for? And how uncomfortable am I willing to be for how long for? Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for your participation. Much appreciated. Well, you can go for as long as you like. Yeah, just take your, just take your chair away. Um, so, but this is really important because when you choose to engage with the market as newer traders, we often don't appreciate we're also contracting unconsciously to put ourselves into situations of discomfort. If you choose to run a marathon, we expect it to be uncomfortable. The training is going to be uncomfortable. The event can be uncomfortable. Trading is the same. People that run marathons, they make that choice. Probably because they've either got a goal they want to achieve, they're raising money for charity, there's some purpose, some sense that makes the comfort worthwhile. But it will be uncomfortable. So we need to appreciate the fact that we, are, we need to be open to that discomfort. Because if we're not open to it, what happens is we become aversive to it. If I think discomfort is negative, if I see it as being bad, anything we label as bad, bad emotions, bad thoughts, negative emotions, negative thoughts, discomfort, negative, bad. If we label anything bad or negative, guess what we try to do? Avoid it. And then I do the behaviours of avoidance, of discomfort, holding my winning trades for longer to avoid the discomfort of taking a loss, getting out of my winning trades early to avoid the discomfort of the market maybe reversing, or to get instant gratification. And then the behaviours I do to avoid the discomfort are the ones that actually reduce my market returns. So am I willing to be uncomfortable, but profitable? Or am I playing for comfort, but acknowledging I'm going to be less profitable? That's the choice. So one thing we can do at the start of the trading day or the start of the week as a strategy, and I have many clients doing this, is we actually remind ourselves of the discomfort we might be facing that day or that week, and that we are willing and open to accept that discomfort. And there might be particular thoughts or emotions that we know might show up in that day, in that trading session. But we just remind ourselves, it's part of the process, and we're willing to be uncomfortable. And again, this is where we can then also think about if we have our thoughts that are difficult, we can 
unhook from those thoughts. Just remind ourselves, these are thoughts I'm having. I don't have to act on them. Third person. Oh, Steve's thinking he can't get out of this trade because he needs to make money. Okay, well, Steve's thinking that. Doesn't mean Steve's got to act on that. Steve's thinking he can't afford to miss this, this next move in the market. This is the big one. Okay, well, Steve's thinking that. Doesn't mean Steve's got to dive in the market right now. So once we start to think about our thoughts as what they are, which is thoughts, we get some distance. Once we start to notice feelings as feelings, oh, okay, I'm feeling some FOMO here. Okay. But I'm just having the feeling of FOMO. Do I need to act on it? Maybe I do, maybe I don't. This is the next point. Function, data. When we have thoughts and emotions, they have a function. They're there for a reason. Do I need to act on it? If I've got some fear showing up, maybe I've detected something in the market that I might need to act on. It might be worthwhile acting on that. But not always. But we can assess, is there some, is there some, uh, some function? Is there, the word we use in, in my world is emotions as data. Yeah, emotions as data. And I like that because if emotions are data, there's no need to get rid of them. When you collect data, like Tom's doing his analysis earlier, made it very clear that he hasn't taken bits out to make it look better. He's not selected the best bits to impress you. He's given you the whole lot. And that's how emotions are. We can't kind of just pick the emotions we want to have. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. Emotions are data. Risk. The emotion of risk is fear. The emotion that relates to reward and opportunity is excitement. These are primary core emotions deep in our biology. Can't get rid of them. But we can be aware of them. We can think about, are they telling me anything of interest? Do I need to act on them? Or I can just have the emotion and take action as is required. And I want to put into sort of, a, I guess, all of that into a relatively usable framework. So if you were in a moment where you needed to, maybe there was a, a situation where you might not follow through with your trading plan, or you could follow through, this might be a technique we could use. So in a situation where you know maybe it's going to be uncomfortable or difficult, there are three core steps that I teach in my clients, and this is literally as easy as ABC, obviously. So first of all, we could acknowledge this is a, tr this is a tricky situation. This is challenging. Just acknowledge sometimes, this is hard. Drawdown is hard. We don't have to deny it. Drawdown is difficult. Sometimes pulling the trigger after a, a series of losing trades is difficult. We might acknowledge a particular thought we're having. We might acknowledge a particular emotion we're feeling. But we can just acknowledge what's going on. It could be external, it could be internal, it could be both, depending on the time frame, how long we've got. But what we do in that first step is we get the shift from here to here. We might at this stage, if we've got time, take a breath or two or three or four. Because if the emotions and the physiology is all increasing, if we're getting that stress response going, as it builds in the body, it wants an outlet. And that's why we get reactive and impulsive. It's a dispelling of energy in our physiology. So we could take a breath or two. Just a slightly longer, slightly slower, slightly deeper breath. Put the brakes on. And then we can choose now how we want to respond in that situation. The question could, e could be as easy as, how do I want to be in this moment? Or it could be, what's the effective action to take in this moment? What do I need to do right now? Or it could be, what would my best trading self do? in this moment. Could even be what would a role model do in this situation. And we're just getting into what's the effective response, but we can be more responsive here because we've done the acknowledging and the breathing. If we try and take action before we get to this A up here, this is where we are likely to be more reactive. Stuff's going on and we react to it. Or we can acknowledge what's going on, external, internal, take a breath or two or three or four, and then we can choose from here, how we might want to respond. Okay. All of you 
And uh, this is thanks to Tom, by the way. This is an early Christmas present from Tom for you. I've got a Trader's Mind journal. Um, that's a great example of doing the work, by the way. And the reason we put that journal together is because lots of my pro clients asked me about how to journal, how, you know, how do we structure it, what goes in it. So it's kind of a bit like a, a blueprint. It's not the perfect journal. There's no such thing, unless that's an individual device, designs it for themselves. But you've all got one. There's three months' worth of journaling you can do in there. Um, when I wrote that journal, I thought it would be pretty useful. Uh, but I've genuinely been surprised by the people that have done that for three months diligently, the amount of feedback that I've received from people, how much it's changed them and their trading, is phenomenal. But what, it, again, it's a reflection of is journaling is an active process of training your psychology, increasing awareness, reflecting, gaining insights, thinking about how to set actions. It asks you about how you want to be each day. It asks you to think about how you have been. It asks you how well have you traded, not how much money did you make, how well did you trade? How have you been this week? What will you do differently next week? What challenges are you going to face? How are you going to cope with those challenges? So it's an active process of actually training your psychology through that process. So my invitation to all of you is give it a go. Yeah, it won't be for everybody, but for those of you that work your way through it and do the three months, I think it'd be worthwhile. Uh, and the only reason it's on here at the moment, um, you've got a free one, but if you liked it and you wanted one, another one for yourself or for a friend or whatever, they're half price at the moment if you wanted one. Um, so feel free. And then Bulletproof Trader, which is my last book I wrote, again, Harriman House are doing a special Christmas offer, so you can have that a bit cheaper if you want it as well. Uh, slides I will send to Tom, so you can have the slides um, for free as well. So if you, I know some of you have been writing notes, which is great, but, if, but you can have the slides as well. Um, other than that, thanks for your attention. Hopefully some things to think about, some things to go away and do. Um, I'll hand over to Tom. I think you've got another 732 <laughs> slides to go. I was sitting in the back and, uh, in a, and I, I was here. And I, okay. so I, was, I, was thinking, I was glad I'm in the back because if I'm in the front, I, was, I, was gonna, I could feel that squash mat from yesterday still in my thighs. But I thought it was incredibly uh, helpful to hear Steve Ward. And there was a couple of things that I picked up on with Steve Ward. And obviously, uh, from his very vocation, Steve travels in, a, uh, in an environment which uh, it's uh, fair to say that there, there are a lot more noughts behind their stake size than many of us. Is that fair to say, Steve? <laughs> I don't, I don't think I asked an incriminating question. Yeah, it's very disparaging, but, but potentially. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> You're not committed. But it, it was, for me, very uh, reassuring in a way to know that, uh, that a couple of things. One, that they have had a bit of a, a horrid time in 2023. And uh, when I compare my performance in 2023 to my performance in 2022, I, I was obviously thinking, oh, I wish that I could go back to 2022. Um, but then I also acknowledged that I am a volatility trader, and I, I really quite thrive on the volatility. And when the market becomes more uh, docile, so to speak, I am certainly not the, the kind of trader. That's OK. I'm certainly not the kind of trader that I would like to be. But then I also picked up on Steve saying, and I thought that was tremendously uh, reassuring. Again, it would, it would mean a lot to me if I could tell you what I experience dealing with you. Um, but it didn't really matter whether I was dealing with you or I wasn't dealing with you. But when, I, when, I, when you hear me in the morning, go, hi, how are you doing, and blah, 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 there, there's quite a lot of work that has gone on before I start talking to you. But, um, <clears throat> but then as, as, as we get into the process of the trading morning and we begin to look at the, and interact with the FTSE and the DAX and also in an America, in, in the US hours, what you, what you don't know is that I have this uh, paralyzing fear <laughs> of losing money uh, every single day. 
maybe I didn't use the right word, because paralyzing means that you can't do anything about it. I'm not quite there. But every single day, I have to kind of reinvent the Tom Hugart that you hear. The, the Tom Hugart that you hear is the, I assume, is at times grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> You should see the equations I get sometimes, and my grumpiness is warranted. But at times I am fatigued, at times I am despondent, at times I am enthusiastic. But whatever the mood, I try to be consistent in my trading. However, and I think this is the really important boy, point that I wanted to get across to you because I think it might help you, is that I actually have to go like, through a uh, a process of changing how I think about taking risk every day. I, I, I wish, and, and that's why I was really grateful that you then said, it, it almost, you gave me permission to feel that way when you said that some of those real top class traders in the world, they are still hoping for that day where they can trade without fear, where they can trade without anxiety, with trading without doubt. And I have, until you said that and verbalized it, you know, have you ever heard that, um, uh, that the comparison is the thief of joy? It's an English expression, and it's essentially saying that if you compare yourself with someone else, you're most likely going to feel pretty shit about yourself at some point, depending on who you compare yourself with. But if I compare myself to someone of the calibers that you are coaching, and they are still searching for the day when they can trade without fear or anxiety or whatever else of a range of emotions they're feeling, well, if they are like that, you in turn have also given me permission to feel like that. That's that not necessarily what I'm aiming for is the perfection where I never ever feel any kind of trepidation before I execute a trade. And that was really reassuring because I've always sort of wondered to myself, well, why can't that day, I know I'm, I'm, I'm the author of this best-selling book and yet here I am and I'm still thinking, yeah, I'm good at losing, but for crying out loud, I wish I didn't have to go through it so often. But what you actually, <laughs> what you actually giving me permission to say, hey, do you know what? Everybody else, even the high performers, they're actually waiting for that day where they can trade without any kind of fear or, or doubt or hesitation. And I wanted to thank you for that because it feels quite a good to be able to know, well, yeah, they feel that as well, as well, but you still go ahead and do it. You just do it, even though you feel that kind of level of, of degree of anxiety. But hey, but it's okay you feel like that because everyone else is feeling as long as it doesn't stop you from doing what is the right thing to do. And having worked on a trading floor for 10 years of my life, what I have witnessed are thousands and thousands of you. And, and, and I could see it myself where it's actually not the, it's, it's rarely 100 different trades that kills our accounts. It's usually always that one trade that kills our account. And then when you spoke about that gentleman who was verbalizing something, but he didn't actually act upon it or whatever the, 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 the context was, well, actually, he had the biggest loss of his career. It was a career-defining loss. Well, how many of us can hand on heart say that we've never gone through that experience where one single loss absolutely just decimated our account to the point where we had to go refund it because I'll be the first to hold my hand. I'll go, oh yeah, I have absolutely done that. But I also learned something from it. But perhaps what I hadn't learned yet until you verbalized it was that actually it's okay to feel that degree of, of doubt every single day. So uh, the way that I go about this, and again, I would like to tell you about it, and it's completely unscripted, but I have a a process that I follow every morning. And that process essentially is just, uh, I've described it some, to some extent in my book, but it's essentially just this puking process where I get so disgusted with how I have traded in the past. And I look at that and I'm very visual. I'm a, I'm a, I, I get, do you know what I say? I'm visual as if I was talking to aliens, but you're all bloody visuals as well because we love charts. It's like the charts is like what I also part of the juice. Oh yeah, I love looking at charts. So we are visually uh, orientated and I 
find that there is no better way in getting me in the mood for the right kind of trading is to look through at some of my bobos. You know, the big losers. Like for example, visualize if you want a market that is just steadily trending lower. Maybe I got one here. Like for example, this one would be a perfect example. Imagine that uh, I sold short here. You, you can't blame me for selling short there. It's above prior bar high in a defined downtrend. Absolutely nothing wrong with selling short right there. But the problem is if you are then adding to the short there, and then you're adding a little bit more there, and you're adding a little bit more there, and then you're getting into the point where you no longer have your lunch hour because, hey, you're still short, you better keep an eye on this, and every single white bar becomes this source of anxiety in your body, in your physical body, and every single black bar becomes this beacon of hope where maybe they are able to say, yeah, oh, you're laughing, but that means you're feeling it as well, don't you? You know, where we get to that point, where every little signal tick up or down becomes a source of yay of oh no, <laughs> oh no. And all I wanted to say with that little anecdote is that I don't ever want to be there. Actually, that's not the right place for me to be. I don't want to feel that place because if I'm reliant on the market for my salvation, which inevitably I am, but I want to be in control. So while I trade big, I will never trade so big that it gets out of control. I want to look at the market and I'll be able to act objectively saying, I want to do this because of this. I don't ever want to not be in control of what I do. And having that, what I call that disgust feeling in the morning might seem a little bit uh, undue punishment to yourself, but when Steve Ward, I'm sorry I keep referring to him, but I, I thought it was very good when you really begin to think deeply about what he's saying. He's saying, well, what kind of trader is it that you want to be? You know, he's talking about, you know, what kind of trader and how will you demonstrate that? Do you remember that slide? How will you demonstrate that? Well, I always look at something like this. And whilst you and I, we are only together for an hour and a half in the morning and an hour, an hour and a half in the afternoon. But I always, when I go through these slides, I always think, you know what? You sell short here and then you get stopped out here and then you contemplate flipping the switch. You flip the switch and the market goes in your favor. And now every single black bar is an opportunity to get in and every single white bar of confirmation you're doing the right thing. I always think of these charts that were, that were past failures and I now turn them into, okay, what if you'd done the opposite? You would have had the trading day of your life. Those trading days where we absolutely obliterate our accounts, if we somehow can portray them visibly and we will take the time to actually go through it as a preparation for the trading day, can turn into the most magnificent fuel for our trading performance. I think that the, 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 the hallmark of a good trader is someone who can actually hold on to the trade and I, I sat in the back and I was thinking, okay, I had hoped that my FTSE statistics was gonna you know, raise the roof and you'd be so excited. But that was not quite the effect that I got. And, and I get it because it's quite, it's quite heavy handed. It's a lot of numbers and perhaps not so much visual to stimulate you. And then it gets a bit hot and, you, and then, then, oh, the Dow has just opened and, and let me just, I understand that. But of course, I'm hoping that that immense amount of material that I have provided for you. For example, what I'm doing here is, so I've displayed all 186 charts where the 20 point stop loss didn't work. Now, the reason why I've included all of those was because I wanted you to have an opportunity to, if you are like me, if, if you are like me, and I think many of you are, then you actually also quite like the chart work. You actually quite like to just study them and feel like, well, what could I have done here? What could I have done differently? And I think, I think it's also not a bad idea to hold this thought in mind. Can you imagine yourself one day to buy a, 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 a pry, bar, pry bar low? That, see that one there? Sorry, where, where it says, Imagine that one day, and this is a, a thought that I have constantly, imagine that I actually bought it there. 
because it just goes below all the prior bar lows and then it actually closes back into the range. Do you see that? It's such a tiny little thing that is very difficult to, to spot, but that low bar there, it goes below the free prior bar lows and then it closes halfway up. Okay, that in itself doesn't actually at all predict that we're gonna head up here over the next two hours. It doesn't at all. But part of, of me, my preparation, visualizing, I call it as it is, yeah, I, and, and with visualization, ladies and gentlemen, it's nothing more than imagining. It's nothing, there's nothing Eastern uh, meditation practice about it. There's nothing chanting about it. There is just, I imagine myself and I'm feeling myself actually buying what turns out to be the low of the day, but I don't know that. And then the market begins to move my way. And then I think to myself, I imagine this, I'm just gonna move my stop loss to break even. So now I can't lose on that. And then I will, I'll buy one more. Okay, well that has gone 10 points in my favor. I'm just gonna put that stop loss to break even and now I'll buy one more. And I, I, and I've done it a couple of times in my life where a move like this, which is nothing more than approximately, what is it, uh, 50 points, that 50 point move turned into like a, a 220 point winner, just on a, but of course, it's not for everybody to want to add to their winning trades, but the problem is, ladies and gentlemen, that once you had the taste of that forbidden fruit, once you have, once you have once added to a winning trade and it actually continues in your favor, it is very difficult to undo. And if we're talking about, if, if we're talking about what separates us as the 5% or the 10% from the 90%, then just hold this thought that I spent 10 years on the trading floor. And I know I've said this before, but it's worth repeating. Is that bothering you? You think it's me? I'll turn it off. Yeah, many things, but I'm definitely not. <laughs> you know when uh, you know when you're outside your comfort zone. Good job. Oh, no, 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 no. Hang on. I. <laughs> okay. Well, no, I think I'll turn that off. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah, okay. I'll turn that off and hopefully I'm able to speak loud enough as it is and maybe that will pick it up. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, oh my word, I lost my trail of thought because of, of that. Ten on your, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> oh, you're smarty pants. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I feel called out now as if I can't remember. <laughs> Ten years on the trading floor and perhaps five or six times over a ten year period did I see people add to a winning trade five or six times over 10 years, Peter. Uh, but tell me, how many times did you see people add to their losing trade? <laughs> oh, every day. <laughs> every hour of the day, because that's what we do. Anyway, so what I'm hoping that I would have achieved with this is that I actually give you an enormous sample space, an enormous opportunity to see how the FTSE reacts when it goes more than 20 points from the first negative bar. Because do you know what, ladies and gentlemen, when as you flick through these, there are a lot of trend days on these. Do you know what I mean by a trend day? A trend day being it opens in one extreme and it closes in the other end of the extreme. And actually seeing these 
and having a physical database about it has immensely improved my understanding of how to trade trend days. Now, could I just talk to you slightly about the 8 and the 13? I've had no feedback, so I don't really know what, you, what you're thinking about. And maybe you're thinking, uh, or maybe you're thinking, well, that's a bit exciting. Obviously, I hope it's the latter because I spent quite a lot of time and I wasn't even sure whether to disclose it or not. But if my mission for trading is to just earn my keeps, not making the big ground swell million pound years, but if it's just to earn my keep, I'm hoping that having brought this to your attention, do you see how every single one of these out here have actually got characteristics? So it's the time of the month where I did the reversal, and I unfortunately haven't been able to fill out every single one of them. But look how frequently, as I flick through this, how the, it actually works, the 8 and the 13. And so what I have done on all 186 slides for you is to indicate whether, and when it says yes, it means that you have executed a trade probably with a point and a half. Um, do you know what I mean by offsets? So imagine the high of the 13th bar was, was 10. <clears throat> that doesn't mean you then buy at 10. It probably means you should buy at 11 and a half or 11.6. That's why it's so important that whoever you trade with, I don't care who you trade with, but you need to make sure you trade with a broker that has tight spreads. That's why it's so important, because otherwise their spread is just gonna fill you. And when it says yes, it means that you, on this particular case, were able to execute a trade and the market moved at least five points in your favor so that you could move the stop loss to break even. And I've done that for, as you can see, quite a lot. And I obviously hope that you will study that. Okay, maybe I did go a little overboard. I, <laughs> yeah, I probably did go a little bit overboard, but it, it was for your benefit. So then we get to the point where the setups actually worked, and then I included all 340 uh, charts so that you had the opportunity to go and study this for yourself. Because obviously that's who I hope that you are. I hope that you're like, okay, I show you all the evidence. I haven't just shown you a handful of charts that go, oh, look at how great this is. I've actually shown you the entire sample space of every chart that worked and every chart that didn't work. So that in the hope that you would sit there when you have a quiet afternoon away from whatever is uh, the boss, the children, the husband, the wives, whatever me, you sit there and go, okay, how would I have traded that? How would I have traded that? How would I have traded that? My, my earliest mentor was a gentleman called Bryce Gilmore. And Bryce always said that you only ever learn to appreciate what's on a chart, what you have trained your eyes to see. And I, I often illustrated that in the early days where I, I took the, the logo of the Federal Express, FedEx, and then I said to people, can you spot the arrow uh, in FedEx? And there's an arrow between, I think it's the D and the E, and, and people are like, where's the E? And it, it just, once you see the, the arrow in the FedEx logo, you can never unsee it. It's the first thing you see. You see that bloody truck on the street, and oh, that's the arrow. But for people who haven't seen that, you can drive them nuts if you say, where's the arrow? And they have no idea what you're talking about. And I hope that, by including this database here, that you will have something of lasting value to you. And yes, I admit that perhaps I just thought I'll give really good value, and maybe I've just overkilled it a little bit. <laughs> I, I know. <clears throat> so, uh, I think it's page 660, okay. So, <laughs> I don't know if this is the right word, but would you like to relax with an exercise? And I'm not gonna be as cruel as Steve Ward, is he there? No, nope, okay, he's not there. I'm not gonna do a thigh buster of an exercise, but I am gonna do an exercise which I think is quite fun, and I did it in Frankfurt um, back in September. In a moment, you'll be asked to raise your hand, and you can raise your left hand, or you can raise your right hand. I'm very nice like that. I'm, I don't actually argue which hand is, uh, it's up to you. If you get tired, then rest your hand, but please do participate to the extent that you are able to, okay? Uh, you will then be asked a series of questions. In reality, you're gonna be asked six questions. 
if you can honestly, and I think the key word here is honestly, not to your fellow traders or your friends or the ones sitting next to you, but to yourself, okay, just to yourself, if you can answer yes, then you keep the hand raised. And of course, the whole point of this exercise is I'm gonna ask the questions and then slowly I'll filter away all the raised hands until hopefully I have proven my point. Is that all right? <laughs> and it's also quite entertaining. But if the answer is no, then you must lower the hand and you're now out of the game and you can simply sit and observe. So let's do a trial just for practice. Everybody, please raise your hand your choice of hand, one hand only, and wait for the question. And remember, this is just a trial. Have you ever added to a losing trade out of anger or desire for revenge? Oh, really? There's actually people who actually took the hand down because I was expecting a sea of a hand. I was expecting every single hand to be up there because we've all, I hope, no, no, I hope, I think that most of us at some point, are you telling me that you never added? Wow, you little saint. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Miss Do Goody over here has never added. Oh, look at you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> hmm. Okay, you can take your hands down. Are you ready for the real exercise? Everybody, please raise your hand. Question one, ahead of the trading day, have you spent time going over a selection of old trades? These old trades are examples of behavior which are most damaging to your emotional well-being as well as the balance of your account. It could be examples of you being impatient, seeking revenge, chasing the market. So if you have gone as a you're part of your pre-flight routine, you've gone through some, some sort of a visual aid, <coughs> slides, PowerPoint, I call it the book of horror, then please keep your hands up. If you haven't done that on a pretty regular basis, I'm not saying you maybe every single morning, but most mornings you actually have a little a reminder to yourself of how badly you've actually done in the past, then please keep your hands up. But well, we filled it out quite a few. Question number two. Ahead of the trading day, have you quietly contemplated on the trading day ahead? For example, for me, I'll go through a pre-flight routine, which will include some time and just closing my eyes, imagining me losing money. Imagining losing money so that when I actually come to it, I don't begin to act like an irrational five-year-old that is throwing my toys out of the pram and I'm doing irrational things so that I am fully prepared, not expecting to lose, but I am prepared for what would happen if I was to find myself into a losing position. And I imagine myself walking away from the screen. Okay. Your visualization is yours, but have you spent a little bit of time just imagining what you are about to get into? Because for most of us, if not all of us, the trading is not a hobby. It's actually something where we derive our bread and butter. And I know that every single day I will have lots and lots of opportunities to make money, but I will have equal as many opportunities to F-U-C-K up my account. Question number three, well done. Ahead of the trading day, have you processed the previous day trading? I find it, hard, I find it odd that when I fr went through losing periods, I could break the pattern by taking some time away from the screen. I began to realize about myself that when I was losing, I wanted to make the lost money back really quickly, and I would be even more reckless and impatient with my entries and trading too big. Now I am mindful of that and ahead of the trading day, and if I feel there are unresolved emotions, I will stop trading. This also applies to days after big wins. I had an opportunity to show off my immense trading skills by making 123,000 pounds in little less than 46 seconds at the first inflation number last year. I've documented it well, only to then... <laughs> piss it away over the ensuing few months. Not particularly interesting trading, and I use that as a fuel of whenever I have big wins, I need to be just as careful with big wins as I am with big losses, because both of them have the absolute propensity to shall we say, unhinge even the best laid plans. I know I can be reckless 
and annoying if I'm losing, but I never really expected that I would become complacent because I felt like I could walk on water. So part of my pre-flight routine absolutely has to include whenever I have good days, I am reset the day after. Being confident is good. Being overconfident, not so good. Okay, question four. During the trading day, do you look at your P&L? You see, what I really wanted to do with this is, do you look at your P&L and your account balance? And I suppose actually I got this wrong. It actually should be that uh, if you look at that, that's probably something where you should put your hand down. The reason being is that when I open my account, obviously it's no secret to me what's on my account, but I place a big fat something that I never trade. It could be platinum or, or um, but I place a trading ticket over my P&L and my account balance because I simply don't want to know how much I am making or losing on the day. I know how many points I'm making and I, can, I got a calculator, but having that account balance beaming back at me, oh my God, you're up 4,000 or you're up 14,000 on the day, it's actually not particularly uh, serving for what it is I want to achieve. Why? Well, because I know myself well enough, my Yana, to know that if I'm losing, I'm going to get into a certain kind of mindset. It's somewhat impatient and it's keen to find my equilibrium. By that, I mean if I'm down, say, X thousand pounds at, in the morning, I will subconsciously, whether I, ad I admit it or not, I will look to make that back. So now I'm no longer trading the market, I'm actually trading my account balance, which is not exactly conducive, because when you're trading your account balance, you, wanna, you have tendencies to be impatient, you have tendencies to want to get even. So my question four should actually have been, you should take the hand down if you're looking at it, because I'm trying to get to the point where what your account balance is, doesn't really matter as long as you can, of course, trade and as long as you're still prudent and you're holding your, your, your stop losses. What is that that Kenny Rogers, he sings, Steve? You gotta know when to hold, you gotta know when to fold, and don't bother looking at your balance, count your, 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 count your winnings when the day is gone. Uh, I won't embarrass you with the actual rhythm. You know, oh, you know. No, 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 David Paul would have sung it. <laughs> Question number five. Are there still any hands left? Nice. Do you regularly engage in physical exercise to burn off the stress hormones from your trading activities? Do you make sure you get sunlight into your eyes every day and you get fresh air into your lungs? And apart from me sounding like your bloody mother, do you actually look after yourself? Do you make sure that you are adequately rested, making sure you sleep soundly or deeply? If it's a yes, then keep your hands up. But if it's a no, then you probably also would benefit immensely from actually beginning to engage in exercise. And I am not some kind of health guru, but I do know that when I am out there and I am really using my physical body, I trade so much better the day after. Final question, ahead of the trading session, are you making sure you're primed your body with good nutrition to ensure your blood sugar is stable and you are <laughs> You were doing so well. I mean, seriously, I'm thinking, what will it take to get this guy off the podium? What are you, coffee and a bagel? No, just a cup of tea. Cup of tea? <laughs> First thing in the morning, I'll do intermittent fasting. So yeah. Well, intermittent fasting, well, you can still, yeah, I know, I'll admit that. No, I'll admit that. I anyway, but there's, a, there's an element to it is that, um, look, diabetes is rife in society. And I, again, you live your lives, I live my life, but I do know that if my blood sugar goes like this, so does my PNL. <laughs> but if my blood sugar goes like this, I'm not saying my blood sugar won't have some swings, but I am much, much better able to make good, tough decisions. Do you know why I want to, to get all the sleep that I get? It's not because I can't trade well under the circumstances I had less sleep, but it's always when I really need to make 
tough decisions, usually about cutting losses. I find, Steve, that if I'm rested, I can take those losses without remorse. I just take them and it's job done. And so when you said that the decisions that you make when you are fatigued versus the decision that you make when you are refreshed can be very different decisions, I absolutely resonated. I didn't want to say anything, but I wanted to shout, yes, Steve, you're absolutely right. And I so agree with you that when I am rested and I've exercised and I've eaten well, you can put me through bloody anything. I'll take on that seal. <laughs> I'll take on that seal challenge. But if I'm tired, oh, Jesus, then a, a, a school run where I'm going the wrong way can sort of make my, my mood go all foul. Okay, I hope that you enjoyed it. And I'm not saying that you have to become gym rats, all of you either, not at all. I don't say that you have to follow a, a certain kind of diet, but I just want you to be at least mindful that a, a say a professional tennis player, I, I've told you this story before, but just in the off chance that I haven't, a few years ago, 2007, I was invited to uh, the VIP tent of Ralph Lauren in Wimbledon. I'm not name dropping because it had absolutely nothing to do with me. I wasn't there because of my dress sense, not at all. I dressed like a hobo on the best of days. No, I was there because I was a plus one of someone else who was far better dressed than I am. <laughs> and there I got to sit next to a gentleman called Luke Donald. And Luke Donald at the time was the 19th best golfer in the world, Steve Ward. 19th best golfer. And when you are sat in the company with the 19th best golfer in the world and Tiger Woods is the best golfer in the world, what do you ask number 19? Why are you not as good as Tiger Woods? <laughs> that, that's what you do, isn't it, Steve? You just go, why, do you, why, are you not as good as, why are you not as good as Tiger? And to his credit, he took the question really seriously and he said, Tiger Woods is a goldfish. He has no memory of what just happened to him. And that very much brings us back to David Paul's whole aspect of the power of now, that you live in this moment. You have no recollection of the 15th hole where you did a double bogey. And what Luke Donald said to me, I thought, it also made it into my book. He said, you know, on a good day, I can hit that ball further than Tiger Woods. I can hit it straighter than Tiger Woods. But Tiger Woods just has this amazing mental resilience that if I screw up on the 15th hole and Tiger Woods screws up on the 15th hole, it's as if he doesn't know it by the time we get to the 16th hole while I'm still, I'm still tormenting myself with how badly I did on the 15th hole. And I thought it was beautiful said, but there's a side story to that. And I didn't know that until I did a research for, uh, I did a speech uh, for uh, CMC markets earlier this year. And I, <clears throat> and I actually looked up, hey, how did Luke Donald actually do after I met him? I'm not saying that because of me, he actually changed his behavior, but I was just curious what happened. And then I found this uh, headline in the, the Guardian newspaper, the Independent News, and it said, Luke Donald celebrates his number, Luke Donald celebrates being number one of 2012. So it was five years later. And then there was a strap on the lean. He credits his mental coach for his meteoric rise. To me, that was such an important little side snippet of information because we all think of golfers as just these mechanical creatures and there they are, and I don't play golf, uh, but the, you know, there they are, and it's like the further the better, and, and the, you're, you're, you're working on different aspects of your game. Never did I think that someone like Luke Donald would hire a mental coach, but then again, he did, and it sort of leads me to believe, well, what's the difference between golf and trading? Surely, there must be so many similarities and so if it's good enough for the world number one at the time, why wouldn't we at least begin to pay some attention to how, how we're actually feeling? And the very fact that, uh, that Steve is here and that, that you seem to have all bought my book, because it couldn't have been my sister that bought all those copies, it, it would actually mean that you are becoming mindful of, of the possibility that your performance 
could be improved significantly beyond just learning more Fibonacci and more Bollinger Bands and more trend lines and, and more moving averages, that perhaps actually your true success really comes from an amalgamation of really intense situational research on certain instruments that you like to trade and you trade them really well, but you couple that with, well, when you are in losers, you have these parameters because you have a deep understanding of the instrument and you cut your losses, but you have also such a deep understanding of how this product tends to operate because the FTSE and the DAX, they're two different things altogether. You can't say that the FTSE can be traded the same way as the DAX. You just can't. So that's what I was hoping. So I expect no hands up. How many hands actually did make it up in the end? So out of 300, I count one, I count two, I count three, and maybe with the, yeah. So out of 300, perhaps at best, at best, there were 10 raised hands. What does that tell you? And I don't think that the things that I asked you what out would be out of the ordinary for someone who is pretending to be a professional trader and that who actually wants to make their monthly and their yearly income from trading. Is it so much that you look after yourself? Because this is a performance sport. It is a performance sport. You are reliant 100% on your own. You can have the best strategies in the world, but if you are incapable of implementing the strategies, well, what good does it do you? Okay, so, um, <clears throat> la di da di da uh, if not now, then no, my word. How, what, how, what time is it? What? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Well, that's not so good, is it? Okay. Uh, one second. Um, okay. Right. Okay, a little bit of a quick thinking here is needed. Steve Ward has provided, a, 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 thank you, a phenomenal insight. I would like to give you a trading technique that I have made myself a very wealthy man on. Uh, look. I, I don't want to stand here and make a promise, but I'm thinking, you have this. I know who you are. That's not meant in a, in a, in a, in a I know who you are. <laughs> but I could, I could run a web seminar for the rest, but I, I really feel like I want to give you my fishing technique because it has been such a game changer for me. I admit that uh, when we started, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to do all of it. But if you look at this here, <clears throat> I think I'm going to go with does practice make perfect, and then fishing stops, and then hopefully, hey, if they come and throw me out, they'll throw me out, right? So this is page. 768. <coughs> You're not laughing at my presentation, are you? No. <coughs> and this will tie neatly into the fishing technique. Does practice make perfect? Uh, I think the problem with charts is that the conventional education is that we always see the full picture. So I'm mindful that I'm being filmed, but I have to be true to myself. Uh, take someone like Al Brooks. I deeply admire the volume of work, deeply admire it, but I have one problem, and it's not necessarily with Al Brooks, it's just the industry as a whole. They always give us the whole bloody picture. And I believe that that will sway the education. I believe that when you 
write about a chart, but you already know what has happened, that will sway your writing. It's almost impossible not to, because to be able to be 100% objective is practically impossible. here. This one here is Malcolm Gladwell. He's a Canadian journalist. And this is Anders Ericsson, a researcher in, humans, in human performance. And what I found was so profoundly interesting is that you have this gentleman here, Anders Ericsson. He's talking about a concept which is wildly popular called the 10,000 hour theory. The idea here is that if you do something for 10,000 hours, you will be an expert at it. And this was popular, 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 popular you know the word I was looking for, <laughs> by this gentleman here called Malcolm Gladwell. And he wrote a book called The Outlier. You're standing there looking at me as if I have to get out. Do I have a bit of, does that mean I have to go? Can I, can I, can I not just, can I have five minutes? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> five minutes. <clears throat> he wrote a book, it became wildly popular about the 10,000 hour rule, and everybody grabbed their calculator going, oh my God, this is amazing, I'll be an expert in chart analysis by July the 15th, 2026, because then I've done 10,000 hours. Anders Ericsson said, hang on there for a second, that is not at all what me and my team were researching. In fact, we said something completely different. We said, okay, fine, it's very good that you practice, but it's the quality of the practice that actually counts. So I believe that the reason why I am good at chart analysis is because I don't just look at a full chart, but I actually have a piece of software. And by the way, don't be swayed by me. I use something called eSignal, but you can do whatever. I think there's something called Ninja Trader that will do it free of charge. But I like to actually teach myself like this. What's gonna happen now? What's gonna happen now? What would you do now? That is true learning and true problem solving. So what was so interesting about when I, when I did the research here is I actually found that more and more people beginning to read, uh, to, to write about the great practice myth, debunking the 10,000 hour rule. What does it take to become an expert on market performer, uh, uh, master performance in a given field? 10,000 hours of practice It's a common rule of thumb popularized by Malcolm Gladwell in his bestseller, Outroyers. It's a catchy, easy to remember and more or less completely false. And it actually turns out that you know what is the greatest angle to the 10,000 hour rule? It's the mentor you use. And so I felt, well, hang on, if you see me as one of your mentors, I can't stand up here and say you should just have a lot of chart analysis time. No, it's the way that we actually go about the chart analysis that really decides whether you come in an expert or not. So to read here, and it turns out, his study shows that there's another important variable that Gladwell doesn't focus on, how good a student teacher is. Now, I can't be your teacher like, a, for example, a music teacher, but what I could say to you is that how about if we started practicing like this, like this, like this, so that it actually resembles the real thing that you see when the markets are unfolding, so that you're not just getting the full picture but you're beginning to unreal it one little element at a time. It is about as realistic as it comes. Okay, have I got five minutes from here? Because I really want to teach them the fishing technique. <laughs> Listen, I'm gonna make a, a and I, please don't, just be, be quiet now, okay? This is not good enough on my part. I, I, it's not my fault that Steve Ward just carries on talking and talking and talking. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I can't shut up the man, and he, he clearly, he clearly went over his allocated time. <laughs> I counted definitely 62 or 63 minutes, and that has done all the difference. I'm going to create 
a, a recording about this, okay? Because you really, really need to hear what I have to say about this. So this is, so you're gonna get the recording of this, but I'm gonna do a web seminar that I record so that you can, so you can hear this. The school, sorry, the, the fishing technique is this. When the market goes fishing for stops under old lows or over old tops, the essence who has bought here will instinctively put their stop loss under the old low. When you think about your own behavior, where do we always, where, where do we always place our stop losses? We always place it under the old lows or, the, or above the old highs. It's instinct, isn't it? Whether it's two points or four points or 10 points, it's just what we do. The fishing technique essentially says that the market, if it comes down here, it will just probably go below the old low. But the moment the market closes above the bar that is the lowest low, that's a buy signal. It will look like this. Market makes a low, goes up, goes down, it goes below the low. Down here, four kinds of orders are taking place. There are people that are short that would like to take profit. There are people who are long who want to be stopped out. There are people who think this is gonna be a breakout and we're gonna go much lower. And then there are people thinking, I wanna buy, be a buyer below, the prior buyer low, very much like the FTSE technique set. <clears throat> you can take pictures of your want, but all of this will be distributed to you in the, uh, the Telegram channel that I have set up for this. And I, I think what I will do uh, tomorrow is I will also send you an email with a downloadable link just to make sure that all of you actually get this presentation. So. I want to see a market where a low is made because of a retest of a price area. And I want, or I want to see a market where a top is about to be made because of a retest. I want to see that previous buyers or sellers, short, are now being stopped out. low, market goes below the low, and this bar here closes above. Now, this might be a daily chart, but it could just as well have been on a five minute chart. Here, the market goes above prior bar high, and it closes below. <coughs> it could also be more interim if you want, Show you a few more examples. NASDAQ today, when I did this, it's just to show you that it's certainly not a perfect strategy, but it works very well in getting runners. Do you see how, how the market is trending lower, makes a retracement, and here it goes below, it closes. Do you see how it went above the prior bar high, and now it closes below? Well, didn't quite work out, did it? What about this one? What would you do here? See, the psychology behind the fishing technique can be taxing. It can be taxing because when, if I asked you to sell short here, well, why would I do that? Because this bar here is the highest bar. Do you see this red bar? And do you see how the market there closes below? If you sell short there, what do you think you'll be thinking? Why am I trading against the trend? And that's why it's really good to have as part of your morning routine charts like that. To actually remind you how 
at times you can end up risking very little and get disproportionate rewards. Anyway, I have vastly underestimated the amount. No, that's not the word. I've vastly overestimated the amount of slides I can get through. Um, Steve, thank you for wanting to do this with me. And to all of you, uh, I, uh, wait, 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 <laughs> wait, wait, just a second. I just want to lay the groundwork, okay? Because I'm a man of my word and I hate to under deliver just the way I am. And so when I put out an 801 slide, it might be that you're thinking that's a little bit over the top. Not to me, it's just not how I work. And I, I just want to let you know that I will have a full recording of this that I will send to you over the next week or so, so that whatever I didn't cover in this two hour seminar, that probably should have been an eight hour seminar, at least you will have that in your inbox at some point. Um, and then all I really have to say is thank you for coming out. I knew that this was going to be difficult, okay? I knew that presenting that kind of hardcore statistics in such a big assembly and not in a schoolroom format that could allow you to ask questions, I knew that was gonna be tricky. But nevertheless, I went ahead because I felt that if I could give you a tool that you'll see 125 days statistically out of 250, then you're going to actually have something where you can say, hey, I know what to do now. That's the first negative behind the foot. I know exactly what to do here. And that's what I wanted to because I felt that that was not something that would come every now and then. It will come 50% of all trading days. Otherwise, I just have this to say, and that is uh, thank you so much. It means a lot to me. Okay.